ESP.bet. Watch and bet live. Okay, I'm here for another episode of Reflections, and my guest for this one is going to be Kenny S., a very famous sniper, opera from France. And the place I want to start here, Kenny, is I didn't follow Source very closely myself because I was obviously like heavily in 1.6. And plus, you only came along towards the end of Source anyway. And so I knew some of the big names. Like I knew who like Shocks and RPK were. Or I knew who Very Games as a team was, but I didn't really know the players at the time, you know. And I did like a little bit of research afterwards once I got to know them in CSGO because obviously they were very good from the beginning. But I wanted to kind of get a sense for when you came along in Source... As far as I can tell, you were still very young at the time. Like, weren't you something like yeah. 16 or something when you when you got to the pro scene? Uh, even 15. 15, 15 okay. yeah. So then obviously you can't have had like a super long source career anyway. And by the time you got to Very Games was actually where there was only something like, I mean, what, like four months before CSGO came out? So did you only really get to the top of CS source towards the end or were you actually at a decent level before Very Games? Um, I was playing a decent level in a way that, well, to picture everything, uh, I was uh, I was really unknown. I was not like I had like I, like zero events, literally zero events. Uh, I was just a online guy, and I got super lucky. I ended up in like um, you know Chesapeake with the best player in France. Um, all of them thought I was a cheater because, you know, I was unknown. I didn't make a single event. Um, and yeah, I was 15. And back then I was tested by very games without, without any events. Uh, at the end, uh, they took another player instead of me because I was super young, which is in the stable. Was, it, was uh, the player they took that guy who stole the laptop? Yeah, yeah, MK, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay. And between my first test with Very Games and the time I joined Very Games, I think it was like I'm not sure about the timeline, but a few months. During those few months, I just made a lot of events. Uh, I had a team. Uh, the Very Games test was really helpful to me. I had a team that was like maybe like top four in France. Okay. So I would say that. This month with the top four team and the four months with very games were the only time I got to play professionally and source. Okay. Were there any players in the team that you're talking about that were that were famous that we would know in CSGO? Mm, probably not. There is Lipton. I don't know if you know Lipton. No, I don't know that person. No. Okay. He's not professional, but he's still like close to the French Frenchies, French in overall. But no, overall there is there is no one. I think they all stopped playing. Okay. Right, okay, so one thing I wanted to know about was, in Source, one thing that I find confusing is there's a lot of players who are CSGO pros who, whenever you talk about them in Source, everyone's like, oh, that guy was an AWPer. So, like, obviously, like, NBK, Existence is probably the one that would shock people the most because he was, like, actually, like, a primary AWPer, right? Was Source different when you used the AWP than CSGO? I'll tell you something. The open source, out of the every CS games, it was the easiest one. Like literally the easiest one. Um, like it was a long time ago. I don't really remember, but I know it was really easy. And I kind of played 1.6, 1.5, 1.3 my entire life. Okay. So coming into CS, uh, CSUS was really easy for me because the game itself was much harder on 1.6. Okay. Um, it was much harder and the op itself was also much harder. So yes, yeah, SUS was a really easy game. And that's why everyone was really good with the orb because the orb, it's like, it was really easy. Really, really easy. Okay. So as we said, like the key detail here for people is when CSGO started, like not a lot of people know this, but actually the team that everyone expected to be number one wasn't NIP. It was actually very games because when everyone played CSGO, okay, it's not the same as Source, but it's definitely more similar to Source than CS 1.6. And I think you can even see that by the fact that over the years, a lot of really good 1.6 players swapped over and were never even vaguely as good. Whereas pretty much everyone who was good in Source became good or sort of good in CSGO. So when Very Games swapped over and everyone who was a 1.6 player heard all these stories, you know, oh, they'd won 40 lands and, you know, they'd been the dominant team, etc. Everyone expected, right, all the players in this team must be very well-known players. And so, for example, we didn't know that, like, NBK was still very young. We didn't know that you were, like, basically, you'd barely been in the, you hadn't even been in the team for a year. So when yeah. CSGO started, 
Did CSGO as a game actually suit you when the game first came out? Uh, I'll talk about my own opinion because I know that back then in video games the opinion was much different. All of them were professional for years already and they were like tired of CSS. But you know, like I was professional and four months ago I had to switch game. It was really frustrating for me. Super frustrating, especially that I didn't really like CSGO at the beginning. Um, well, I was especially super stubborn about the fact that I didn't want to change the game. Uh, I love tools and I was professional for, for a few months and I wanted to, to explore more of the game. Yes. I mean, that's actually quite a common thing I noticed, which is that if you're someone who like, you know, you work your way up through a game, if yeah. they switch games, you feel like, what the fuck? I never got my chance to actually like have a few years at the top, you know, in the best team. Yeah, exactly. But at the end of the day, like it was probably the biggest chance I ever had. The fact that I was with Chimbery Games during the Switch, uh, because I was like, if I was not with Regam during the Switch, it would have been much e harder for me. Because, like, because of that, I always remain on the top. Uh, I got the chance to to show myself and stuff. But otherwise, it would have been much harder. Uh, but yeah, I, the the game was not something uh, I would like. CS:GO was not something I would really liked uh, at the beginning. I remember like playing on the beta before the game itself was out. And I remember my manager be, being better than me. So, <laughs> okay. so yeah, I, I was really like pessimistic about, about the, the game. And before my first event, which was Jumac Valencia, um, I was super bad. And the first, like, the first game was like a different game for me. And my first event was actually pretty, pretty decent. But yeah, before that, I was really like against CSGO. Okay, so I, so one thing people might know, I mean, obviously most people watching this interview weren't around at the beginning of CSGO, but a famous detail a lot of people do know is that, okay, so everyone knows NIP won like 87 maps. And in that period of time, they also played very games in the first four finals in a row in CSGO. Oh, yeah. It was always very games versus NIP. And obviously, since NIP won 87 maps, they obviously didn't lose any of these maps, even though, you know, a couple of them were close. Some of them were blowouts, right? When you came into the game yourself, did you know much about like the players who were in NIP? Did you actually know that they were going to be a good team? Uh, well, something we have to know about the CSS players back then is that we are a, you, we are really fans about the 1.6 players. Oh, like okay. all of them, like Forrest, Geraint, Markelov, Edward, yes. all of them, we knew them really well. And like... We are really fan of them. So yeah, we're basically aware that they will be a great team no matter what. Uh, so yeah, it was not like surprising to see them at the top so quickly, I would say. Okay. But when you had to play them in all these finals, mm. right? Okay, I've actually noticed in some other games where, where two people meet in the finals, it's always one team winning. In fact, it's happening right now, obviously, with SK and FaZe. What usually happens is when you first lose to the other team, you think to yourself, like, well, I'm, well you know, we're very good as well. Maybe that was just a bad day. We'll get them next time. And then what happens is when you lost a few times, fans always say, like, oh, you know, you know, you choke versus them or they're your nemesis. They'll always beat you. And usually pro players think to themselves, like, oh, you know, that's like that's exaggerated or whatever. And they try to deny, like, nah, you know, we'll get them next time. Uh, yeah. But eventually it gets to you, doesn't it, if you keep losing over and over? I think the first time our excuse was like because I know NIP were started playing CSGO before we did. Yes. Like and we we're like, it's fine guys, they just played before we started playing. The next time we get them. Uh and the next time uh we got wrecked again. Um <laughs> uh, and then yeah, I think the something like a vicious circle has been created, like they had a psychological advantage on us and I think we even reached a point where playing us like for them was super easy. Yes. And they got super confident. So um it was so fucking long time ago and it's really hard to remind, like to to remember. Sure. But yeah, I think there was that uh, psychological barrier. And also the fact that we had really inexperienced players such as me, 
Uh, I remember not being the player I am today, for example. Uh, I remember that I was not handling the pressure like I do today, like I do now. Um, like as I told you, I was I was a kind of like I had like four months as professional player. It was on yes. source. There was like at best to keep people watching us playing. So yeah, I remember some finals where like. I was doing a lot of weird moves, you know, like a lot of mistakes and that kind of thing. So add the fact that they had like a psychological advantage on us, the fact that I was super inexperienced and I was like under pressure a lot. I was also under pressure a lot in my gym. Uh, I remember being so young and, and as I said, I, well, I'm not the, I was not the player I am today. And... I remember were you, like, were you a, a rager at the time? Did you get no, upset when things went wrong? No. No, I was the opposite. Like I was, okay. like quiet. I was super quiet. My communication was really bad. It was really bad. Um, I was doing a mistake, and they were like, "Oh, Kenny, you made a mistake here." I was like, "I know I made a mistake, but I was not saying anything. I was not like, yeah, okay, I know, my bad." Okay. Or just talking about it, you know. I was just super quiet and. Well, which would be a problem in a team like Very Games, right? Yeah, it was. Yeah, of course it was. And that's why I got kicked at the end. It was because I was super inexperienced and I was, you know, it's super hard for me that I was young, I was unknown, and the day after I was playing with such players like Existent and BK, RPK, yes. uh, Smith, like those players were like legend for me. And I had so many, res so much respect for them. Not like I don't have respect anymore, but uh, it's different sure. now. Yes, yes. <laughs> but yeah, that was like super impressive for me. And I I could not find my my spot in the team, right? I couldn't find my place. I couldn't find... Like, it was super hard for me. And, and the fact that I was not talking, it got existence super pissed. And there was a time where it was super disrespectful to me, where it just like broke me. And like it's fine now. Like I mean, we talked about it, and I mean, in what sense? Like, was he kind of like uh, he was like, you know, you know, like a drill sergeant, just in your face, like, in the army, you know? Like, I remember like a boot camp we did in Belgium before. I think ESCA finals. Okay. Like you know the game where NBK was so fucking good, and but we yes. still lost sixteen fourteen, six fourteen. Both times, yes. Yeah. Well, my bad to be honest. Right. <laughs> Uh, well, there was that bootcamp. I'm taking the story because now we're laughing about it with existence. Sure, yeah. Like, as I told you, I was a player like, who didn't react to stuff. I was just like being silent to everything they were saying. And at one point, existence was like a lot on me. He was a lot on me, even when I didn't do anything bad, you know, he was a lot on me. And at the boot camp, I remember he was like literally insulting me, insulting my mom. He was saying like I was a fucking retard and you should have seen my face. I was so so sad and I didn't know what to say. But like, like he somehow crossed the limits. Yeah. But I could understand why, because... I was super shy and super quiet and it's super hard because it felt like facing a wall and they didn't know if I was learning, they didn't know if I was improving. Okay. So so yeah, I think uh, they got super pissed because of that. And I actually learned a lot from existence, but especially when I got kicked from Rare Games. It's like, you know, you get you get that huge slap in your face. Yes, and that huge slap helps you to improve, and also helps you to to understand what was wrong. So everything they were asking me asking me to do, I did it, but not during my time in very games. I did it just right. straight afterwards. Yes, if it makes sense. Yes. Okay. So actually, if you remember, just a few months before you got kicked from the team was when Scream joined the team because obviously yeah. RPK retired. Now, when he came into the team, uh, he was there for a couple of years, you know, 
it seemed to me like from the outside, like he was a very weird player when I tried to watch and I didn't know anything about like the politics of the French scene and, you know, who likes who and what people's personalities are like. Because what was weird was, because yes, he had really good aim. He'd have some games that looked amazing. You know, you could drop like 30 kills versus NIP. But then he would have these other games where you watched and it looked like, okay, so very games was, because it was such a tactical team, was like, you know, very, like the words like cohesive in English, you know, like everyone fits together and it's all all doing one thing. And sometimes he looked like he was just doing something on his own or he didn't know what he was meant to be doing. Did he have problems playing on resistance, do you think? Uh, as far as I remember, he doesn't have any problems. Uh, I think he, even now he's still, I think existence style is one of his favorites as well. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's uh, that's weird, but I think existence as this, even though the game style he has might looks not good for star players such as Scream or even myself. Yes. But actually, like I know, like Scream myself, like playing under existence um, leading was probably the best and uh, our favorite experience so far. So, I mean, in a way, do, if it, do, it isn't like one of the positives of his system is if you are the star player, kind of things are set up for you, right? People support you, you get everything you need. Yeah, yeah. Existence is really good to 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 like to use his players. I would say, like maybe not overall the players, but his star players. Like he knows how to use them. And yeah, despite the fact that we had like a lot of tactic stuff with uh, very games, I think Scream was pretty free and um and yeah existence was using him pretty pretty good in a pretty good way okay so actually as you referenced there obviously like it's a big blow if you're a young player you got your chance at the top team you're playing with all these legendary players and then you get kicked a few months later so the team you went to was ldlc yeah now this squad I can tell people some of the names. They're going to remember nearly all of them because it had Happy, who admittedly wasn't as big a name at this point in time. It had Apex, who was, you know, someone on the rise. It had Maniac. So again, these are all players he played with later on as well. And it had SF, who obviously was the player who ended up being banned. People might remember. <laughs> people just forget about him, though. He's one of the ones that's out. So well, he was there. The that's it. <laughs> but the thing is, when we, when we list off the names in this team, I know it was the very beginning of the game, so maybe some of them weren't as good. But this is a pretty good lineup, right? And you had some decent results. I remember that time yeah. you were like top four at the DreamHack Summer event. You could have maybe made the final of that one. It was a good team in its own way, right? What type of team was it? Describe it to me. Oh, it was also the first team that beat an IP... Uh, French team to beat an IP. Online though, but it was a French team to beat an IP. Okay. Uh, we're a really young team. Uh, immature, I would say. Especially me, Apex, um, even RP somehow. Um, and SF, even SF. I actually, actually, there was Maniac that is... That is maniac. Everyone knows maniac. He is um, he's a much person. He's he's the one talking well and that kind of stuff. Uh, but the rest of the team was really still inexperienced. Um, so I would say that we are super good and we had a lot of potential, but we could not face failure. And as soon as we as we actually faced the failure, we could not like bounce back from it. Um, I remember the the Dreamhack Summer, uh, which was the uh, probably one of the only events I, uh, we actually played together with the uh, with the MS Red Call Colon. Yes. Um, we had like really high expectation about this tournament because we are super good. We had a bootcamp before where we won the Nanani called the Fnatic Frag Out, where we sure. beat an IP 2-0 uh, after a great match. We are super happy. We are super good, and we lost to Epsilon back then on the on the semifinal, which was Flusha. It's basically Fnatic, but without yeah, Pronax. Yes. Exactly. And after this event, like everything that was bad in the team just came out. Uh, the fact that we are really unstable players, unstable people, immature. Uh, I remember me especially that I could not handle the, that defeat. Uh, I was expecting to play an IP in final and maybe even beat them. But like everything but the final was just a fail to me. 
And I remember SF me being really motivated, uh, demotivated after this event and super disappointed. So, yeah, let's say that we kind of destroyed the team. But overall, like everyone were like really immature, despite the potential we had. We didn't have like enough structure, I would say. So I think that's that, that was the, mess, the, mo- the main problem is that we could not, like our communication was definitely not professional. And back then, anyway, the game was not that professional as it is today. And, and yeah, we were facing different problems than today anyway. So, yeah. When, when you were in this team, as you said, obviously you'd been in very games and then things hadn't worked out and maybe you hadn't at that time learned the lessons of what you needed to improve on and how to play in a team, etc. Right? I remember, actually, even though, I, yes, obviously I watched you when you were in very games, but in very games, as you mentioned, because in the finals, especially, you weren't as good with the nerves. You were very up and down. So you could have games that were very good. But you could also have games that were kind of like, okay, maybe this guy isn't that great. But in LDLC, I remember, you had lots of games where it looked like you just like were straight carrying the game. Did you, yeah. Were you able to play? I mean, did you have a very free role in that team? What was it like? What, what changed that made you kind of a more dominant player? <coughs> no, I told you about very games that I was really impressed by the people around me. So myself... I was just putting myself a lot of limits, you know. I was like, oh, I don't dare doing this, I don't dare doing this, I don't dare doing this. I could have done this. Like, I was free to do it, but I didn't dare to do it. You know what I mean? And, like, going to ADLC, I got a lot of confidence. Um, I was, like, a different player. I was like, I learned a lot of, about my uh, very good experience. I, um, yeah, I got everything kind of improved in my, uh, in my game style. I was more confident. I was, I knew I had to be more like a leader, if it makes sense, right? Yeah. Because, like, I know I was playing with different players. Once again, I respected those players from AGLC2, but it was different. Uh, I was coming from very games, you see. So I was coming from the best team in the world with an IP back then. So I was, I, I felt like really like legitimate somehow. So, yes. so yeah, that, 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 that's the reason why I felt more comfortable playing. I didn't have like more freedom. I just took those freedom. Like I, I just like, I just proved myself. I just, I, I was not shy. I was not the, the shy guy that, that was in this, in this corner listening to people and, and sure. do what, that, what people want me, wanted me to do. Okay. So w- here's the thing, okay. Whenever, like, uh, this is a good example, right, of where social media, I actually think, makes people who are fans understand less about the game. Because if you ever read social media, it's really famous that if, you know, say, I won't say which team's okay, but you could you could easily think of a country that has teams like this. Say a team who's the rival team of, a, of the other team from that country makes it to the final and, like, wins the tournament, then the, t- the players who are in the rival team will all tweet them, like, oh, great job, like, I was really cheering for you in the final. But here's the thing. In my expe- <laughs> exactly. In my experience, whenever anyone's been kicked from a team... Even if they're your friends, some of the players that were in the team, part of you deep down hopes they lose because you want to you oh, want yeah. them to kind of see that like they miss you, you know. So was it cut? Was it tough when obviously Shocks replaced you in very games, and then a few months later they they overtook him, they became the number one team. Was, was it kind of rough to think like maybe I'm never going to get that chance again? Yeah, well, it was super tough, um, and I wanted them to lose, and it is what it is. Uh, the French rivalry is between teams is different from other countries. We, let's be honest, we always want peop- like the other team to lose, no matter what. Yes. But it's even stronger when you you form a team is playing, and they just like benched you or kicked you. When, like I remember the first time I was, there was that game, very games against LGLC, and us LGLC we actually won. Like, I remember, like, I was super happy. I was super, super happy. I felt like a revenge, like, and, but when they start winning against an IP, yeah, of course, I was super, like, disappointed. 
Uh, but I was not like super down in the, in the like, I was not like, I let my chance go because I knew that they knew that I was young and inexperienced and they knew that I had the potential to be a better player. So I knew I would have my chance anyway. So I was not super like, like I was not like sad in a way that I would feel like I would not have my chance anymore. I was just sad that my former team that kicked me was winning without me. Okay. So when you were <coughs> in this LDLC team, and then as you said, you didn't play many lands, it broke up, but then you made like like a vaguely similar team because obviously you had the squad that became recursive. People might remember at the first major, Dream at Winter, where you had Happy with you still. And then you had a couple of other names who actually would be known for the next few years. But again, they've now retired or gone, which is GMX and Uzi. And you had Maniac back with you. So, okay, you had some names that we know, right? When you were in these different teams with Happy, who was Happy back then as a player? Because, I mean, I get the sense, right? Wasn't he a bit different from the person everyone... I mean, he's got a very famous personality now and of his playing style now. Was he different as a as a player back then and a leader? Yeah, I feel like he was, he was not, like, confident as he can be today. Um, the, the When I say confidence, is that he could not rely his game style on itself. Like he could have done like a few years ago, or even today. Yes. Um, because like I mean, individual wise, individual wise, he was really good when like in 2014 when yes. he actually started. Like he started changing. I think when he joined Envious, IGLC. I mean, like the. Yes. Uh, but yeah, back then he was. Um, he was working really hard for the team. I remember. He was creating a lot of good tactics. That's something I always. That that was different between him and existence. When I joined IGLC, I noticed that the um, tactics panel was actually much bigger with IGLC, right? Oh, okay. Yeah, that that's weird. I know that's a paradox. Uh, you could have think other, like the the other way, but no, yes. like. Like literally, I remember having like a lot, a lot of tactics on every max. At least like five or ten tactics by maps, which was a lot. But that that was working. Like that was working with AGLC back then, and and yeah, I was really surprised in a good way when I joined AGLC after very games. Um, I feel like he was someone really. Like he's, he, I felt like he had even more leadership than he, he had he has today, because today, you know, I feel like his ego is a bit bigger than than himself sometimes. Okay. Uh, so he might have more credit back then, but yeah, as far as I remember, he was a bit different, a little bit less confident, but a lot about, a lot focused on on his role and not about. What can be? What can people say? He was just like winning. He, wa- he wanted to win, and I remember him as a great tactician. He was. He was. Um, he created a lot of stuff. I mean, a lot of stuff that people use afterwards. And yeah, that's a, that, that, that's the thing I remember. I don't remember exactly everything about happy or it was. Uh, I mean, happy is happy, and he was happy anyway. But yeah, he was he was working really hard, and I, what shocked me the most, in a good way, was the the tactic panel, which was okay. much more detailed and than existence one. Okay. So when you went to this first major DreamHack Winter 2013 with this team that I, just, I outlined who it was. This is a good example of where if someone only looked at the results, it really doesn't tell the story of this team because actually, yes, this team didn't come in as like a big favorite or anything. And in fact, you actually had one of the toughest groups because in your group, you had Uh, Nip, you had I by Power, who were the American team, and no one at that point in time actually knew what this team was going to be like. You know, this was actually one of the first big events they kind of failed. And then the other team was basically Virtus Pro. It was the exact lineup of Virtus Pro, but when they were called Universal Soldiers. So first of all, to even make it out of this group is, is not guaranteed and your team did pretty well. The 
The only team he lost to was Nip, and in fact, even that was a close game. And then in the round of eight in the in the quarterfinals, you played Fnatic, who, I mean, everyone knows now, won the tournament, and you even won a map off them. You actually did pretty well there. So I remember as well, this was another tournament where you were doing pretty well, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, this tournament was uh, was actually a good surprise for us. And it was really messy for, for us to go. We're like struggling to find an organization. The qualifier was super hard. Mouse Sports, Chris J and stuff tried to... Excuse me for the word, but fucked us. Uh, we still managed to go to the event, and yeah, indeed we had uh, probably the toughest group. Um, but yeah, we were good, champ, uh, and we we managed to qualify for the group for the playoff after beating VP after a great comeback. Uh, and yeah, we lost to the to the winner. Uh, that was a long time ago, damn. <laughs> uh, what was the question again? Excuse me. Well, listen, I'm just saying you, you did very well at this tournament, right? Uh, well, as a team, yeah, we did. Like, we did. And my se- myself, yeah. myself, I think uh, I did well. I had some up and downs. I think I was there for, for some crucial moments. Okay. And I remember being really good for the, the game Dust 2 against Fnatic. Which was the map we won, and but also we could have won the game because the third map was trained, and I think like we won like eight runs as T side, which was which was a lot of runs be- back then. Uh, but I remember being bad this game, and you know it's it was not about up and down. I think overall like there was there was not like star players uh, during this Jumac uh, run. There was mostly like people shining. Each of them shining at some times, and just a, ch- a good team cohesion. I think we we had a good team spirit. We we all get along, and we had uh, we had a lot of fun playing together. So yeah, we were not like among the favorites, but I think we had a, we had a great mindset, and uh, and we had uh, we had nothing to lose. Okay, right at this point in time. Obviously, <laughs> like actually, as we mentioned before, when they were beating uh, NIP and they were winning tournaments, Very Games was actually the number one ranked team. And even at this tournament, they still made top four, you know, and people thought they were still like the best team. They went over to the Titan organization. So at the time, in theory, there was no way to get back into that squad. Now, I remember what happened was after this team, for some reason, you went and you made sort of like a hybrid team with the clan mystic players right so you went yeah. where it was like it was like half clan mystic and then it was like you gmx and sf and then at the time the mystic players were hearts was the in-game leader and then kiyashima this was actually the first team where everyone kind of found out who he was what was why did he go and make this team why did the team from dream winter not stick together i, I don't have the choice I don't, uh, l- at, at this point after the, the major uh, Clan Mystic was there, if you remember well, there was yes. Apex and, and they were they won the ESWC just before. Yes. But they literally failed the major, which was a really bad performance for them. Um, and Apex came to me and he wanted to make a new team, kind of like making a GSC again, which I was fine with that. But I felt like the major was a good performance for the team and I didn't want to change. Um, but Hypex went to Maniac afterwards and he had a proposal from LGLC and they had a salary, which was a small salary, but back then it was a salary, which... It's a big deal, right? It's a big deal. And they just decided to create a team without me. <laughs> without me. So they made Apex happy, Uzi, Kali, and... And who's the last one? What's the last one? Uh, no, I don't remember the last one. Uh, let's think. Apex Kiyoshima? No. No. Let's think. Who would it be? Maniac? Did I yeah, say Maniac? Maniac I yeah, Maniac. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So they met that team. Uh, they didn't want to play with me. Uh, so they took Kali instead. Because they remember me as the guy who kind of destroyed LGLC back then. Uh, which was... Yeah, which was which was the truth. Um, it How won- did you destroy the team? Well, I said I was not really happy about the okay. res- 
the Dreamhack win the Dreamhack summer result back then, sure. and I was like just like fuck that and I don't want to play anymore, right. and and I was like going to the event afterwards. I was like fuck that. I just don't want to play this event, and we lost to to Fnatic, which was free, sweeter, and like a team that we are supposed to be better anyway. Uh, so we disband, and yeah, it was a, one of the reasons why we disband. So knowing that, they decided to to take Kali uh, instead of me, and then yeah, we created like Clumistic as like a default team somehow. Like the the people that that went in the trash made their own team. Yes. Um, so yeah, I think that's where my struggle started, basically. But uh, that's also where I started being like super good as a player. Uh, I started to improve myself. It was like after very games, it was one of the the big slap I had in the face. And you know, I'm the kind of person who needs to. to need to, motivation, right? Yeah, can, yeah, right. To get motivation and to understand why I have to improve and actually improve it, I'm the kind of person who needs to get like. Like something really tough happening, like a huge slap in my face. Otherwise, I just don't understand. You know, it's um, it's sad, but it's true. Okay. Uh, so yeah, the the fight that they created the team without me was, and that was a backstab somehow because you know there was the major the major spot for Katowice afterwards, yes. and yes. we kind of lost the, the major spot. So we are super sad, and, and that was a that was a. I took it like a backstab and a huge slap in my face. So I had this mindset that I had when I got kicked from very games. They were like, I just want to show them that they made a mistake. You know what I mean? Yes. And yeah. So Okay, so when uh you said the story where where like initially Apex came to you and he was like, let's make a team, and then all of a sudden he's making a team with someone else, right? This is a thing that I heard from some French players that are like, listen, I know now for the last few years, everyone loves Apex. Everyone thinks he's a great teammate and he's, he's really ch turned his reputation around. But I heard that in CSGO for the first few years, a lot of the people who used to be in like the teams with Apex before where he then left or, you know, obviously he did this with the French shuffle where he came over to you guys in Titan. People think that he was kind of like, this is kind of the way he did things. He was kind of like a snake in the grass. You know, he was always looking for like his next angle. He was going to do something. He was looking for the best all the time, yeah. Like, not for the necessarily the best, but That's yeah, I think, I, yeah, I think he wanted to leave from CS. You know, like he was like back then, he was a lot of of an opportunist person. I would say opportunist, yes, yeah, very opportunist, yeah, and like even when we had the. Even when we had the chance to create a team with Neo and Taz, he really wanted to do it, and you know he he was really like he could have like swayed, you know, he could have he was opportunist and and easy to influence. So so yeah, I think the fact that it was not professional back then was. Yeah, I think he was kind of a snake. I mean, I love him. He's my friend. Sure. But yeah, he was kind of a snake. It's okay, he's changed now. It's no problem. Yeah, Again, yeah. It's, like the, it's like the existence thing. It's all, it's all funny when you look back uh, now. It, it's not the time. Exactly, but, yeah. But to be honest, he would be fine with that. Like, it was like, yeah, look, uh, I created a GLC because there was a salary and I was not getting paid before. And yes. I can understand, like, we always loved being CS and we always, like, played CS for a reason, which was not the money. But it's also cool to be to be getting paid playing for sure. CS. For sure. Okay. So as you said, because you weren't in the recursive team anymore, you didn't have the, the major slot, which is what you would have had coming from that spot because you got top eight. But you got to the next major, you got to Katowice, and yeah. this was where the Clan Mystic team... I mean, it's funny because this is an example of where, again, you got 
the super tough group. But this one you didn't get out of because this group was where you had LGB, which was basically like the Olaf Meister, Krims, Twist, Dennis. So everyone knows now that the super yeah. good Nachi at this event was the way everyone found out just like they were really good. <laughs> yeah. Then you had Na'Vi who, okay, they were kind of like rebuilding, but they had Guardian at this point in time. So pretty good team still in some ways. And then you had Complexity, which is basically the team that became Cloud9 later. It was like the North American Sean Gares, Hiko, et cetera. So you didn't get out of this group stage, right? At yep. this point in your career, even though you said, yes, it was motivating that, you know, you'd been kicked from all these teams, isn't it a bit depressing if you're a really good player and you're stuck on like the third best French team and now you're not even getting out of group stage? It's, it's got to be somewhat a bit, that's a bit of a downer, right? Yeah, it, yeah, it was. It was, um, it was, especially that back then, if you're top three, if you're in the top, be, top three best team in, the, in your country, it's not like you played a lot of, Chair one stuff, you know. Yes. Like the, it was harder before. I mean, it's easy for me because I'm playing for G2 and we're constantly in the in a good ranking, right? But uh, Club Mystic, we are not doing a lot of good tournaments. We are doing a lot of online leagues that were, and we were playing like pretty bad teams. And yeah, of course, I was, I was playing like good teams sometimes. But most of the time, I was just playing like lower tournaments, and and yeah, that's what's depressing. And I remember doing a doing a boot camp before before Katowice, the major with Clan Mystic, and we're like we are only free at the boot camp, which didn't make sense. <laughs> like, okay. and like, you want me to be honest? We are just we're not playing. We are just having fun. We are drinking. We're like. I felt like the whole team was not motivated anyway, you know? Like, we are all depressed about the situation and, like, we liked each other and we tried to to make something, but somehow we had, like, just, like, depressed that we could not... Like, I was depressed and I was not seeing people being really involved and wanting to, to make things better, so I just followed and... And then Club Mystic was like a fun team, you know. <laughs> sure. So yeah, that was that was really hard. That's why that's why I'm saying that Club Mystic. This is why it started being like super super tough for me. Uh, yeah, super tough for me, and I didn't know what what would happen next. I was just like moving forward, but blindly. Yes. Well, understandably, because as we said, hey, like there's there's not really any obvious path as to what's going to happen next. But what's obviously quite crazy is it was only something like a month after, maybe even less after that tournament where you got brought back to very games. Well, I mean, it's Titan at the Titan, time. Yeah. Yes, Titan, same ba same squad, basically, where they literally just did the reverse move of what they did. I think, it, believe it or not, I believe it was actually the same day or a year prior was when they kicked you and they got in shocks. They did the reverse. Yeah. Shocks left and you got brought back. So yeah. when this move happened, had you actually still been in contact with people from the t Titan slash very games team? Did you still kind of have like some sense that maybe they might bring me back? Well, first of all, it was super unexpected for me. And something in, like why I'm here today, why I'm a professional player, why I got tested the first time in very games when I was like a non player without any experience, without any events, it's because of Nyak. Nyak I always been like my kind of father, my kind of father in the game. Okay. Like he made me grow up as a person, as a player. Um he made me join very games. He kicked me from very games, and he called me back in Titan. He never stopped following me. I remember playing with Clam Stick, like, and I remember him being at my home because he's always been my friend and watching me playing that official game with Clam Stick, right? And he was like always giving me advice. He didn't have to do it because I was not in his team, yeah. but he never stopped believing in me. He knew my potential somehow, and and yeah. It, Always gave me advice to improve, um, to be a better person, better player. Um, and yeah, that's how, like, I remember like when Shocks left Titan. Uh, once again, it was super unexpected for everyone. Yes. Uh, and I know I was not the first choice. I was the first choice of uh, the Nyak first choice. Who, who do you think was the first choice? Who was the first choice back then? I mean, it has to be someone who wasn't in, so maybe Kaylee or Happy or Apex uh, or... 
Uh, yeah, I think it was happy, maybe happy. Yeah, okay. I, I, I don't exactly remember. I don't exactly remember, but uh, I know that I was not the first shot for existence in BK because you remember me as the inexperienced kid, and even though I was obviously showing better stuff, they could not be sure I was like a much different player. Uh, but yeah, like they chose the uh, the Nyak judgment. And they didn't regret it. So yeah, that's that's Nyak, all on Nyak, to be honest. Okay. So when you got back into the team, as you said, like you know, existence in MBK obviously still remembered you the way you were. Funnily enough, those guys actually have that same quality. I think to this day, where when when they have like their mind made up about someone, things have to go really differently to change their mind. Like that player has to have like yeah. way better results, or they have to have way worse results before they kind of like review that judgment. So when you rejoined the team. Did they kind of like just give you a fresh, like new start completely? And it's like, right, you're back in the team. You're going to be the star player again. D- did you kind of have to like earn their trust or something? What was it like? Because it seemed like you you played pretty well in that team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. well, yeah, I did. Uh, no, well, first of all, back then, there was not those things like star players. Well, there was, but not as such war sure. stuff. Yes. Um, I think it's mostly myself. Like... I didn't want the very good experience to happen again. Uh, I was a much more confident player. Uh, I knew what was wrong with the first experience. Uh, I know I know that I could just trust myself and do whatever I not whatever I want, but I know they trust me, right? Because sure. back then, like in very I was just constantly thinking like why I'm in this team, why do I deserve to be here, why I'm here, and you know, I didn't realize that they trusted me. Yes. And as soon as I joined Titan, I just knew that I had to, I had to be myself, just myself, right? And I, I was just being myself, I think. Was in this team, especially this lineup, so we're talking about before the French Shuffle, Right. It was a good team. Like I remember you had a few tournaments where part of the problem was the team was playing well. It was a good level. But in some of the early tournaments, you always had to play Nip. And actually at this point in oh, time, yeah. Nip won most of the matches you played. Right? Was there pressure being like you've replaced Shocks? Obviously, they used to beat Nip all the time. You, you want to you be the number one team again? Right? Was, was it a tough period? Uh, well, not a tough because uh, I mean, I know too f- a tougher. But uh, yeah, first of all, like uh, even with shocks, at the end they were losing to Nip again. Yes. Like the major uh, and stuff, they were losing to Nip again. And yeah, we had uh, we had to face them really early in tournaments, like quarterfinal at the Dreamhack, and yes. like I remember it being really frustrating. Um, but I think the I think the psychological problem was still there. Yes. But mostly with players like Existence, because I remember the first time playing Nip, but with Titan, I was totally like, uh, like I didn't have pressure. I was like, I was like, I always lost them anyway, so just fuck it and <laughs> sure. play, play yeah. like play like you 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 know to play. And since then, I think I started being like a really pain in the ass for Nip. Like if you ask them, I might be one of the most annoying player they they might have faced. Yes, and, sure. and and I think it was uh, it was mostly coming from. I think they were a bear team overall anyway at this yeah. time. They were better team anyway, and uh, and yeah, some players in the team were just tired of losing them and and started having like that bad psychological habit to to maybe underestimate them. Okay, well, okay. Let me ask this then. So, I, I, like, that's actually usually something I've noticed is if a team ever usually loses to the same team over and over again, especially if they're both really good teams. So in theory, you'd think, you know, like even if one wins most, you think, you know, maybe they'll win like seven and the other one wins three out of 10, you know? So if one team's winning most of the time, I think it's usually never one player. You know, it's usually like a team-wide mentality or there's a couple of players who of maybe course. are very influential who have problems against that team. So when, it doesn't have to be just Nip, when teams like Very Games or Titan would lose big games... 
how would people like Existence and BK take this? Because obviously they were known as kind of the very serious players, right? Who, who in theory, I mean, they're just very serious people, aren't they? Uh, so, so don't remember about very games. I remember about Titan. Um, like Existence, that's something I hate about Existence, okay? It's after the tournaments, uh, I remember, for example, an event like the, uh, a Jeffinity. It was a yes, Jeffinity. G3, G3, yes. Um, I think it was Apex already, like the second version of Titan after the shuffle. But Existence is the kind of person who will just make a debriefing for hours and hours and for <laughs> hours. Right after the tournament? That's so boring. Like, I mean, like, you was talking a lot. A lot, a lot, of, and a lot of things were kind of fertile. And yeah, the problem with existence was he, he was talking a lot, and he was blaming a lot other people. And back then, I know he was not like blaming himself a lot. Like uh, he, would, he never took credit if you know he did a bad tactical read or he, he messed up the veto. Yeah, something. if he messed up something, even if he's individually in the performing, he, he's not like. It's not like, you know, uh, this one was my bad and here was my bad. It, it was just trying to look the issue, like the issue was somewhere, all the time somewhere. And most of the time was right. I mean, it can be only his po like himself. Sure. But yeah, as far as remember, existence is a lot into like talking, long talk, really long talk uh, after, lo after losing. Um, and NBK now NBK is uh, NBK is more like straight to the point, uh, straight to the point. With a, he shows up with a lot of smart stuff, and yeah, it's just straight to the point. And he doesn't have the existence. He never doesn't have this like barrier. Like he's just like flush it to you and and get over it and work on it, which is. Which is a difficult approach for a certain player because, um, like, when you touch the ego, yeah, there are some players that prefer the nicest way, the nicer way, the, some player that needs to have the rougher way. And, yes. uh, it depends on the player, right? Yeah. Existence more is like, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't have filters. It just, you know, it doesn't have filters. But yes. it, talks, it talks a lot too. <laughs> Okay, so actually, the the tournament you you talked about was one I wanted to ask about was Gfinity G three because this was the one where everything was looking great. I remember this was the one where that actually this was the first tournament that that new Fnatic tournament team played with Crims and Olaf Meister etc. And you beat those guys, you beat the my Power Squad, you got to the final, you were playing Virtus Pro, who at the time you know they were like still very good, but they'd had like a little bit of a dip in form. It was looking like right, oh maybe they're going to win this event, and then. Wasn't this one of the matches where, like, this is why that term exists, right? The Virtus Plow. Oh, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, I remember this game. I will always remember this game because I never faced, like, I feel like Virtus Pro is always good when it plays against my team. But I remember this game, I was like, we could not do anything. There was, like, hitting the shots, like, they were faster, they were better, they were, like, the Virtus Pro, exactly, like, and I remember playing them in the group stage, and the group stage game was much it was easier. Game, yeah. It was a great game. We were like 15-15 on Mirage, and we played Mirage and New York and Final, and Mirage was much faster. We lost like 15-8 or something, and they was really, really good. I remember, yeah. Okay. So the problem here is, the reason why I set it up, that even if the results at some of the other tournaments weren't that good, he was still clearly a very good team. Part of the problem, as you said, is, for example, a dream hack. I mean, famously, we were all sat there waiting to see what the quarterfinal draw was, and then it was like Nip and Very Games. Uh, sorry, what? Well, Titan and Nip, rather. And these were obviously two of the best teams. So the problem here is, since you were one of the best teams, people only remember the majors, Kenny. You know that. And so when ESL1 Cologne came along, this was the one where, I mean, funnily enough, it's the same story in your career. You get the really hard group. You've got the Cloud9 and you've got Dignitas, so both very good teams. Obviously, Dignitas is like Astralis basically now. Cloud9, that, that was actually probably their best tournament ever, if everyone remembers. Yeah. And then what happened here was you played an amazing game against Cloud9. It was a really epic game, right? Yeah, uh, very epic and frustrating game. Yeah, uh, yeah. 
Well, uh, we lost. Uh, well, we didn't qualify to the playoff for this game anyway. Uh, yeah. What's the question again? <laughs> well, okay. So, so there was the game against Cloud9, and then what people might not remember is when you went to play the next match, you had to play Dignitas, who was basically like it was Device and Dupree and Zipnix, but with Fetish as the in-game leader. Yeah. And the randomizer gave uh, you Nuke. And here's the thing, right? Your team was good on Nuke, but the yeah. problem is Dignitas especially was super famous for if they got Nuke, just winning like, you know, they would win like 13 CT rounds or something. Did he kind of know already that this game was over before he played it? Like, so the fact that randomizer, we remember, like, I don't remember the choice we had, uh, but we knew that we would start side anyway. And fuck no, we didn't want Nuke. Like, Nuke was the last map we wanted. Like, we... I couldn't say we started the game by, like, we're going to lose, we're going to get wrecked. Because that's not how you start a game. Sure, obviously. But in the back of our head, we were like, fuck, how unlucky we are. Like, literally starting T-side on Nuke for the deciding game, fucked by the randomizer playing Dinitas. Which is which was the best map back then, especially the best side was the city yes. side, and we lost fourteen one, and yeah, I mean, let's say that that's why I'm saying that we lost the, we didn't qualify because because of the first game and not because of the last game because right. the last game was anyway just bad circumstances all the way long. Sure, okay. So obviously, after this tournament, the the infamous first French shuffle happened. And it's totally understandable why it happened. Because even though, as we said, Titan was a good team, and obviously at the time had a very good organization and proper salaries and all this stuff, but had a bad major. Meanwhile, at the same time, and obviously they'd had two in a row now, and then at the same time, Happy's LDLC team had almost gone to the final. So whenever you have a scenario like that, there's always going to be a shuffle because think about it logically. Like one team has all the money and the and the and the big name players, and the other team did better, and they're always going to try and take some of their players. So it made perfect sense to me as to why the shuffle happened. But here's the part that it was always very confusing to me because I didn't know the players that personally at the time. Was I thought this whole shuffle would happen, and you'd make very similar teams, but no one from outside of France expected that NBK in existence would split apart. These two players seemed like they were like. Mm. They were stuck together. They would always be together. They they were the team, basically. You know, they were like the core of the team. What what happened between the two of them? Because I know in the original story, actually, you guys in Titan thought that NBK was going to be in Titan, and then in NBK's reflections, he said that actually he was telling you, "No, come with me, and we'll go to LDLC." And so, what happened? Because I know for years afterwards, in fact, until fairly recently. NBK actually still sort of like really disliked existence for some reason. It wasn't just that he didn't want to play with him. Somehow he actually just disliked everything about him, like his style of play. So, so what what happened between these two? I think it comes from the... Uh, well, first of all, there is a, there is something very famous in the French chain is that existence is somehow cursed or he has something that makes him a different player when he's going to a major. Some uh, truth to that though, right? Yeah. Well, I, I think so, yeah. Uh, I think that it started being really psychological for him. And, and I think that was one of the reasons. Also, uh, there was some disagreements about uh, how we were playing. Um, like, existence is like, back then I remember that how we were training, how we were practicing, everything was not like we wanted it to be, you know. And existence is not the kind of person who wanted to change before. I don't know now, but he didn't really want wanted to change. Uh, so I think NBK just got tired of it, and yeah, he started he started the new shuffle with sharks. He wanted to be the in-game leader at first. NBK wanted to be the in-game leader. Yes. Um, they wanted Smith. They wanted me. They wanted so, Kyo. So why didn't you go? Uh, well, why did I go? Because um, I felt like I owed a lot to Nyak and Existence because, like, I was really struggling, like, during my time in Club Mystic, and they kind of take me out of hell, you know? 
Yeah. And I feel like I couldn't live like that. I feel like I owe them. I couldn't live. I, I wanted to stay with them. I want. I wanted to to show them I'm loyal and, and I appreciate what it did to what it did to me. Uh, and I also wanted to play again with Apex because Apex always been one of my closest friends and one of my oldest friend on on CS. Like okay. I, I was talking to him, he was on LGLC on SUS in two thousand like. 11 yes or 12 sounds about right yeah and i was friend with him and like because of the you know backstab stuff uh, with uh, lglc club mystic stuff uh we were like not friends anymore <laughs> literally not friends anymore we we're like we literally hated each other for a while and but deep in deep in us we we were still like you know we still like like each other, so I wanted to play. I wanted to play with Apex again, and yeah, I wanted to to show her existence there yeah, that everything they did for me, that I I didn't forget, and I would give them back. Okay, so when you made this team, and you get obviously you guys got in. Kaylee and Apex and Maniac and this was the the new Titan team. The uh, first event was that Dreamhack event in Stockholm. So when you won this event and you beat Fnatic and you beat LD, the new LDLC, the team we're talking about right now, this must have been an amazing event. Yeah. Yeah, well, um, we, we had like uh, playing uh, LGS in the final. And as we say, I we talk about earlier, like the fact that everything has been created from a shuffle, the rivalry was really huge. Like I never lived such a big rivalry between two French teams. Like yes. today, for example, it's nothing. Like like I, I would even say that today there is no rivalry between MGS and us. Sure, yeah. People but, are friends now, right? Yeah. And because today the difference is a bit bigger. Like I mean like Envious is struggling a little bit more than we than we do, uh, but back then, like despite the shuffle, we are still a good team. Titan, we're a good team, and LGC created like a super team. Like yes. this was a very good team, and and yeah, beating them was that was amazing. That was really amazing, and and the, all the run during the Dreamhack Stockholm was amazing because we even like beat uh, NIP during the group stage, and that was a really really like encouraging first tournament for us. Okay, so one actually, one aspect I wanted to ask about then is so during this period before Kaylee got banned, when you had this rivalry with LDLC where you played them a whole bunch of times in the next few months, you played them at that Star Series event in Ukraine, obviously not only ASWC, but you played them at the ASWC qualifier and you actually won at the qualifier and then they beat you at ESWC itself. As you say here, the rivalry was really strong, right? Like these players didn't just want to beat each other. Some of them sort of hate each other, right? Uh, it's not like hate each other. Uh... But yeah, the game got over everything. Like I remember them being like super cocky to us. Like they were talking to us like we are shit, you know, like when they were starting to beat us, right? Uh like they were like, You noobs anyway, like uh, we're gonna beat you, we're gonna destroy you, we're gonna dismantle you. Like it was really like a lot of trash talking. Yeah. Uh, but between us, it was not like in public. It was between sure. us. Yes. Um, something that could not happen today. Like for example, uh, I'm not saying I want MGS to win, uh, but if I talk to to them, I would just be like, "Hey, good luck, guys." Sure. While while back then it would just have been like, not good luck. Like uh, like they would even if we not play against them, yeah. they would like. They would watch a game in the lounge, and we could literally hear them scream when we are losing rounds. <laughs> like, okay. you, know, you see, and that yeah. was the same for us. Like, I remember, like the we had the gaming house with Titan at uh, the Dreamhack Winter Major. Yes. And when all of my did that boost, yes, you I, was, it. I was like on Twitter, I was like, "Oh, that's such a genius move." <laughs> and I remember okay. when they when they load the game. 
like yeah. Hypex and I were celebrating like we won. Like literally. <laughs> like, yeah, that's that's all the way where we was before. That's that was really like strong. Okay. Like when you had this scenario where Kaylee got banned, right? Okay, I know that at the time in the team, no one knew he cheated and no one actually this is one of the problems with that story. No one can ever really know when he cheated because all we know is he just got banned at the time he got banned when he joined on and joined a server and VAC banned him. And even the circumstances of that are, are quite uh, it's such a muddy story because of the whole thing with the SEA helping them somehow get information, etc. What I want to know is this. Do, do you actually think at any time before that, like any of the lands that Kaylee actually cheated, what's your take? Uh, that's what I actually find you asking because when it got banned, a few days later, we had all, uh, all together at the gaming house and we started analyzing like his POV. But, yeah. you know, in the perspective where we're like, it's cheating, right? Because it was obviously Vagban and even yes. though we thought it was an accident, uh, it was an accident or, or anyway at the, at, the, at the beginning because you don't want to believe it. Yeah. Uh, we started watching games, especially when it was playing with AGLC, like at the Major against NIP, uh, you know, the Colog Major. Yes. Uh, at Copenhagen games against Titan, and every time the games got super close, like Kali was doing something like amazing, like something. And sometimes, like his crosshair, like we're looking, we're like, damn, what the fuck is that? That crosshair placement, you know? Yes. And we don't have any proof to say he was cheating here or sure. here or here. But to me, yeah, he was cheating during tournaments. I don't know when, I don't know why, I don't know at, if it was all the time or just some rounds or it was just touching something. But yeah, now there is no doubt for me that I cheated during tournaments. Okay. Because obviously that's what makes it tough to talk about that particular lineup because yeah, everyone's going to wonder forever, was he just cheating during the games? Because when you had this run with that team where not only did you win the DreamHack tournament, like I said, but you beat all DLC and you were you were still a pretty good team overall. Yeah, you yeah. weren't the best, certainly, and you didn't win many tournaments otherwise. But this is a team that had potential, right? I mean, not only did was Existence still still a good in-game leader, but you had this what, probably one of the strongest dual op setups ever, right? When you and Kaylee both had an op, it looked really, really dominant. So this team, if it could have continued, surely would have done something, right? Uh, I'll tell you something. Um, like... When SMN, the first guy, got banned, uh, Kali started being super bad, okay? Uh, and we had, uh, we had the, the, the preparation time be uh, before the, the major, the DreamHack winter. Yes. And Kali was bad. I was super confident myself. And we are like literally destroying everyone, like 25-5 in practice, like everyone. And... What I could say is that we could at least reach the semi-final, like with or without Kelly, to be honest. Because Kelly, after the estimate ban, we had like two weeks practice where it was literally not here. It was really bad. And we are still winning like easily and we are super good. Like we are super good. We are super confident for the Juma Winter. And yeah, I feel like we, we, were, we were a great team. And maybe not like in a super long term, but at least in the short midterm, we could have been like a really strong opponent. And, and once again, I think we could have reached easily the, the semi-final doing the, the major. Okay. Because I remember, obviously, what's interesting about this period in time was everyone actually who was around at the time knew already your level was very, very good. It was probably the best you'd ever played at that point in time. You were really, really good. But then when Kaylee got banned... Part of the problem was because, as you said, LDLC was like a super team, there wasn't really any other players to take because the only other players who weren't in LDLC or Titan were all the leftover players. It was, I mean, unless you wanted Scream back, it was basically you had to get like Uzi or you had to get GM. You know, these aren't players that people yeah. are want as a star player. So yeah, we do have a choice, yeah. At the time, also, all the other players who've since come up, they were just very inexperienced, you know, no one knew any of these guys. And so famously, one, one thing people forget, okay, is before you got RPK back, you went to that ESEA tournament and you had to use, who was at the time, the manager, right? Irek, the guy yeah. who used to play in Clan Mystic. Yeah, he was and a I coach back then. He was a and coach I remember me. at this tournament, okay, this was the one where 
you individually were going super ham, like you played against Fnatic, and yeah. you almost like single-handedly beat them. You remember this tournament? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, I think it was one of the the best tournament I ever played. Yeah, I do. Right, because what I wanted to know was this, right? Again, this is something I think is interesting about your career. If people have noticed the trend so far, right? Most people would get depressed and lose hope only when they're like, you know, something bad happens, like they get kicked from a team or they're at the bottom point, right? It seems like. Normally, when something bad happens, initially, you actually, like, respond pretty positively. Because this period, okay, when you're playing really great, as you said, the team actually had chances to do things. Most people would think that would just be depressing, but you, it seemed like you got even better. Yeah, that's the thing, is that I was depressed to not attend the major and all the situation was going. But the truth is, I was good. Like, I was super good, and and it was really fun to play, you know? Like it was so fun that like joining a server, no matter the opponent I was facing, I knew I would just like destroy them. And it was super fun. So no matter the, the situation, the circumstances, I knew I would be good and I would have fun. So I was not like depressed in this way, if you know what I mean, if it makes sense. Yes. Because the game was so fun that I was like, doesn't matter anyway. I'm just, I was somehow playing for myself because, yeah, you, I, we understand it and, you know, we could have, this tournament could have been much better too. But, yeah, I mean, I couldn't have been depressed when I was showing that level, you know? Did the fact that, I mean, remember in this team, like basically, Kaylee and Kenny S were the star players and you've lost Kaylee and you haven't been able to replace him with someone else who's a star player. Like even when RPK came back, obviously he was, you know, he'd been out of the game for like two years. You know, he had to really work his way back in and it wasn't actually until like quite a while later he got very good again, right? Do you think the fact that you were playing so well and the fact that really there wasn't that many other options, like you were like the main way they were going to win the game, did existence, do you think, actually like consciously try to make the game all about Kenny S at that point in time? I don't know. Uh, I think it did. Uh, no matter what he did, uh, I don't know if it was consciously though. Um, I think everything I was doing was working somehow because I was like super confident, and and no matter what I was doing, I knew it would be working. So, like, existence was playing with me for for a while now, and. In Titan, I always kind of show that level. So I think he just blindly trusted me. And, you know, I was cutting a lot of stuff. I was just cutting a lot of individual stuff. I was just saying like, okay, guys, we're going to do this on myself. And he was just, you know, he was never saying no because he, know, he knows it will, be, it will work. And I think that just the fact that he trusted me and... He didn't really do stuff to put me in the best situation, but the fact that he was trusting me and the fact that he was saying yes to everything I was saying, yeah, I think he kind of made the game around me. That I also made myself the game around me, and yes. they all did because they saw I was like reaching like one of probably like my top level and like yeah. Yeah, basically, yeah, that's that was pretty natural, I would say. Okay. So as I mentioned, like from the ESEA line, where obviously like having a stand in, Fnatic was the number one team in the world. You shouldn't have any chance to beat them, but you were doing amazingly in this series. And in fact, throughout your career, whenever Fnatic got their really good lineup with Olaf Meister, Crims, etc. Okay, obviously, historically, they're one of the best teams ever. There's very few teams they ever struggled against. But it's us, yeah. Your team had so much success against them, right? Or, or even if you would lose the game, you would always do really well. I mean, f people might remember there was a famous comment that Olaf Meister once said just before he became super good, where he actually said this in an interview. He said something like, you know, he, that in 1.6, he'd played gathers with like the really good players. But he said, like, you know, I never really was like afraid of players. I just thought, you know, they're good players. But he said, the only player I was ever afraid of was Kenny S. Why do you yeah. think you were so good against Fnatic in particular? Uh, I think the game style, it's kind of like Nip. I was good against Nip too, because they rely a lot on the on the individual skill. They rely a lot on, like for example, like a player like me, 
it's much easier for me to play Fnatic than VP, for example. VP is like a lot of tactics, a lot of like sneaky stuff. Yes. Um, and a lot of utilities. I mean, the game style, the Fnatic game style was perfect for me. Like they were looking for me. They were going to my crosser and they were not like super disciplined, you know? Yes. So the fact that I was playing aggressive, um, they were not disciplined, so they couldn't really counter it, right? And they were themselves really aggressive. And for example, if you're aggressive against me, in certain situations, it's a mistake because, like, I love, like, I'm an opera that loves being close, being like, I'm playing a lot with my instincts. And, and yeah, I just feel like there were some teams that have the game style that fits me. Like an IP, okay. like Fnatic, like you know the game side, they're, they're just playing like really, like they trust themselves a lot. And they so know you, they're good. Yeah. So you said earlier that at this time, you know, you felt like, I mean, even without having Kaylee, you felt like, you know, if I join a server, it's going to be fun because, you know, I'm, basically you can do whatever you want. At the time, did you think that you were the best CSGO player? At this time? Yes. Uh. Oof. Yeah, I think I, I yeah, I think I, I thought I was, yeah. I think I thought I was, yeah. Okay. Cause one thing I remember, but this is before the AWP got nerfed, was one thing that I whenever I watched your games, like I watched a lot of the really good AWPers. So like I saw like Guardian, Skadoodle, like the, all these guys were around back then. But one thing that I noticed you were very, very good at before the nerf was like hitting no scopes or like, I mean, technically it's a quick scope, you know what I mean? Hit whether you just you do the right click, right? Whenever yeah. you did this, like famously in CSGO, unlike 1.6, it's not 100% accurate. You know, they can't, it, like if you ever put on that box that shows where <laughs> it goes, you know, it can go all over the place sometimes. But you hit a lot of these shots. Now I noticed that in later days, I've actually seen that like Simple's pretty good doing those. And whenever I've seen him like warm up and on stream, I, is there, was there like a, did you have kind of like a trick to it? Was there like a counter strafe trick or something that other people hadn't figured out? Because it seemed like you were very, very good compared to even the good other good AWPers. Uh, I think what makes a difference with opers like me and like the really edit ones and the others is the knowledge we have of the weapon. And like, I really got good when I played a lot. And uh, I was really focused on, you know, pushing the limits of the weapon on what I can do with the op. And, uh, like I know everything perfectly about the weapon. I know when to quickscope. I know. I I, I just know it per so perfectly that I, I know what to do in the exact moment. But as I said, my game style is really instinctive, and quickscope itself is something pretty instinctive as well. Sure. If it makes sense. Well, okay. Then along these lines, then. <laughs> In a weird way, even though obviously, like this team that of this Titan team was like clearly limited because of losing Kaylee and because you're still waiting for RPK to get back into the game, etc. So it, like, it was unrealistic to think the team was actually going to win events. I mean, I know you came close to winning that like Pantamera tournament, the one where you play Fnatic in the final and you had a couple of tournaments where you're in like semifinals, etc. Mm. But like, obviously this is like a very, very tough situation no matter how good a player is because his team is not quite as good as most of the teams he's playing against. In a way, did you kind of enjoy that though? Like, I mean, you seem to play better than ever when your team was in this bad spot. Like everything happened with Titan, I don't regret it. Also, the fact that I refuse a GSC, I don't regret it. Like I enjoy it's every single tournament I played with them because it kind of made me grow as a player, as a person, as a personality, and and yeah, I would say that with the level I showed. Like at one point I was tired, okay, uh, with this early exit at the end of Titan. Yes. But really at the end. Otherwise I enjoy every single tournament I play with them. And of course I enjoy it mostly because, mostly because I, I was really good back then, you know? 
like by, I'm saying Biden like I'm bad today. <laughs> I'm, not, sure. yes. I'm, not, I'm not saying I'm bad today, but I mean like the game was that was different, the different years than today. And um, and yeah, I don't regret anything. And and I, I think it was also the perfect timing for me to to stop playing with Titan when I the, the second shuffle happened. And and if I had to wait again, I would wait again. And despite the early exit, sometimes I I just had a lot of fun playing, and that's probably when I like the chim the chim atmosphere was great, um, and overall, yeah, as a player, I was like I was one. It was my honeymoon, and maybe I would find that again one okay. day, but like I never had so much fun playing CS than when I was playing with Titan. Okay. So, okay. I, I mean, technically, I'm going to skip a, a little bit ahead here, but since we're talking about the op, let's talk about when they, the op nerf happened. Mm. Now, what people might not remember is the timing of when they actually put this nerf out was basically like April Fool's Day. Wasn't it literally? I think it was actually on April Fool's Day. It was like the night before. And so actually, this isn't a joke. Some people did think maybe it's a joke. Maybe they've just done this, you know, like, haha, we've nerfed the most powerful weapon. But, yeah. you know, a day later, they're going to revert it. Now, obviously... They have never reverted, it, Kenny. They haven't actually changed anything <laughs> since then. And whatever they've done to it, here's the sad thing, okay? I've always said this. Because most players in CS aren't AWPers, I know some rifle players use it sometimes, you know, but the majority of pro players aren't AWPers. The majority of people who play for fun aren't AWPers. And it is true, to get killed by an AWP, it's the most annoying weapon to die to because you just instantly die, you know? Like, at least if someone shoots you with a rifle, you think, oh, maybe it was a good shot, you know? But the problem is, as a result, even pro players actually always will be in favor of, like, the AWP nerf. They're always like, yeah, it should have been nerfed, you know, it was too powerful, like... Yeah, and I think the same. And you, you agree, right? So so what what do you think of, of this uh, nerf, then? I agree that the AWP deserved the nerf that was too powerful, but I think the nerf was too much. Like, they made it too slow. I mean... Yeah, that's it. That just the fact that they had to make it slower, but not that slow, you know? Just a little nerf. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I truly believe it was too powerful back then. So, I mean, I was especially frustrated about it when it was nerfed. Uh, but I got used to it now. But yeah, like, I'm just being super honest when I'm saying that it this a nerf, but definitely too much. Yeah, definitely too much. Did that actually play into some of the stuff later on where you, you lost motivation in the game? Was that a, was that a factor at all? Uh, well, since then, my motivation has been super unstable. Uh, so back then, yeah, I would say that the, yeah, the nerf was definitely a huge part of the like demotivating demotivation stuff. But then, you know, the motivation grow back and then I had new stuff that makes me unmotivated again. And that's just the story of my, of my career. And that's something I always had to work on is like my motivation. Like you can see it with my performance anyway. Like you can see when I'm motivated or not. You can see it when I, if I'm playing good, you will see that. I put the effort to play good. If I don't play good, it's just I decided to not play good. You know. Okay. It's just I don't. Know, I, I sounds like a shit kid, an asshole. And yeah, I'm. I, I am. <laughs> but I'm a really emotional person. And uh, the smallest thing that happens in my life. Or whatever that can inf that that can make sway my that can sway my my motivation. Okay. Right, okay. We'll get we'll get to some of that later. So let me let me ask you this then. All right. So just before the op nerf was when Katowice 2015 took place, yeah. and this has to be okay. You notice the story on the other one. I always was very fair. I was always like it was a very tough group, and you know, and you know, oh, you had this really bad match. Right. This one is the one where I actually started to believe in the existence curse because at this yeah. one, right, the group was you had Envious, okay, yeah, yeah really good team. 
You had LGB, which at the time was the Norwegian lineup. So, okay, some yeah, good players no, no. now, but not that famous. Uh, there, was, there was Rain and yeah, yes. pretty much and then you And then there was the German Penta team, which was like, <laughs> I mean, it, pretty it wasn't a very good team. And what happened at this tournament was, okay, the first game you played, you played Envious on Cobblestone. <laughs> it was a really great game. It was a we close sh- game. You, we should never have this game. We, we are, are leading in the game, yes. We are leading 14-12 on City side on Cobble. Our money was like 11k each players, and we lost 16-14. And, and then, then this we is got, the real problem, though, right? Is yeah. that it, it, that's fine? You can lose to the number one team the way the groups work. You just go out second, but then you went down. You played Penta, and they completely smashed you, right? It, it was literally our chance to reach the playoff. Yeah, I know. Yeah, well, yeah, I think. Uh, the smashers. First of all, the map was a mistake. Playing cash, I don't. Th- I, I think I don't know how we ended playing cash, but it was a mistake. Randomizer again. <laughs> like cash was, yeah. Well, the randomizer, but for sure we felt confident in cash. But the thing is, we're good in cash, but we are predictable as fuck. You know right. what was a game plan on cash? Halfex and I going going a main and killing everyone. Can't walk. It's not a tactic, it, is it? No, it's not. And it can't. It can't walk all the time. And guess sure. what? It didn't walk. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Everything was like the first game in Losable and the Panther game. Was it similar for you? Did this tournament make you start to wonder? Like, is there something wrong with existence at majors? Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, I think so. Yeah, um, I think uh, Katowice was. Kind of like the the moment where we realized that, yeah, yeah, because at some point back then, existence was at like you can feel that he felt more tension during during a major. He was not the same player, the same person. Like he means good. He wanted to, to he wanted to put himself in the best conditions. But at the end of the day, it was just like adding pressure on himself. And yeah, I think he, yeah, I think that's where we, we kind of realized that he was cursed. And then he, and then we had the, the shuffle and then, you know, he just kept losing in group stage. Yes, and, exactly. And the, the curse kept going and every, every French players that went into it and there's, like that was one of the reasons why he was kid from G2, you know, like for sure, yeah. And like that's really crazy to think that there is such thing as curse, you know. Well, here's but, the thing. I mean, but you there can't is. Describe yeah, it. There yeah, exactly. is. Yeah. The point is, it's not magical. It's something inside his head, right? It just yeah. affects him differently. I, I mean, obviously, players have different problems against. I mean, famously, some just just against one team or something. And yeah, it's true. Again, at majors, there's only one he ever did good at, and it was the first one. So doesn't really feel it feels logical that there's a curse right mm. okay well let me ask you this question so another factor i remember some french players told me that they thought was part of the reason why uh some of the existence teams like had problems or didn't always work out especially one of the reasons why some people wanted to leave existence teams was they said that like this might sound like a weird thing to complain about because obviously most people would want their in-game leader to be studying the game all the time to be making everyone practice all the time that's that's the job of an in-game leader but people said he over he overdoes it though he goes just too much like you know there's too much practice on one map and there's too much like we have to do every tactic exactly does he go too far it does, it does, and the problem is not that it goes too far, it's that you end up at the tournament with four maps, for example, which is three or four maps, sometimes even three, which was definitely not, which is definitely not enough, especially if you want to aim for the best of three. Uh, yeah, I mean, the way, that's why I said earlier, the way was we are practicing with existence, like, it was not the right way, like, in my opinion, it was not the right way because, like, it's not like we wanted to be, like, we wanted to be super good on three maps. Like, we could have been, like, super good on one or two maps, uh, good on two maps, and okay, average on one map, even two yes. maps. Um, I think that's better to be, to have this example than being, like, perfectly good on three maps. You know what I mean? Because at the end, 
like with the, especially with the randomizer stuff and you know there is it's not like it's not like you can count on the fact that you will end up on those maps anyway because there is best of three there is randomizer in certain tournaments and yeah obviously the way Exxon was working was not something we were pretty okay with okay so when you were um in this in this particular team the titan all the different variants of it one of the people you actually got to play quite a lot of big matches against was navi and obviously at the time navi had guardian he was the other really famous opera in the game and a bit like you he was also always pretty good pretty much the whole time in csgo with the op and it was, you were two with the big names mm. now what did you actually think of what, what was like the old school guardian like in that sense was he as good as you were an opera did you think you were better uh, the old school opera. What do you mean? Like, into, what what pair are we Guardian. talking about? Yeah, what pair are we talking about? What do you mean? Like, the timeline. <laughs> oh right, like like beginning of CS:GO to like 2014, because obviously you know, like he didn't get his amazing uh, teams until to be, like until uh, until he joined. Like, I think until 2015. Yes. Like, except GW. I didn't feel like I had like much like revolts, you know. Okay. Like I, I didn't count Guardian. Like I know he was a good opera, but you know, like it was not like the the kind of opus that was really working back then. Like the opus that were shining back then were the opus that play really aggressively. Like like GW me. Like I think Guardian got like got among the best when yes. there was the op nerf because okay. the other opus like kind of lost a part of the level and he kind of used that to to rise and shine okay I, I have a question for you so obviously the next topic is going to be the second french shuffle where now you went over to I mean, it wasn't LDLC, it was Envious now, obviously, but basically the same same squads. Now, when this happened, again, you went one way, Shox went the other way, mm. right? Since you never played with the Shox until you got to G2 later, right? did you did you have any sort of a rivalry with him? Because, I mean, you were the only two players, basically, in these squads that never got to play together until later. Not really, uh, not really. Uh, I, the truth is... Like, I uh, kind of always been frustrated of that situation that, like, I was joining, he was leaving, I'm leaving, he's joining, you know? I, I mean, mean, it's kind of weird, right? Because you'd think logically, if, if you're going to make it the best French team, you'd want the two best French players, right? Yeah, well, yeah, and that's why I'm saying that it was mostly frustrating. And I didn't see, like, any kind of, of rivalry with him. Uh... I, I don't have any special reason why, but I didn't have any any rivalry. I don't have any rivalry with French players, to be honest. Like, I, I feel the only rivalry I can feel, uh, like it's maybe with the other opus, not in France, but all around the world, you know. Okay. Uh, otherwise, I don't have much rivalry. Like, even if I was aiming, like. Like it, for me, the like I, I don't give a shit about the other players. Uh, I'm not considering myself. Like uh, it's just the opus. Like just be honest, it's just the opus. And I'm pretty sure that if you ask the same question to to Gordon, Fallen, or whatever, they like it's stronger. It depends on the opus. Might be stronger that. Overall, no, I didn't have any rivalry we with other players than Opus. Okay. So uh, when you came to this French shuffle and you got to go to uh, the Envious team, which is obviously a very, very good team, a better team than Titan, unfortunately, you didn't go over there in the same form that we were talking about earlier in the interview where you were like the best player and everything was amazing because, as we said, the team had started to get worse in Titan, results were worse, the op nerf happened, yeah. you, you were less motivated, right? When you uh, joined... Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, Q guy, Q guy, sorry. Okay. When you joined Envious, um, obviously this is a team where when you were talking earlier and you said that actually you think that like the existence of style is very good for star players, right? Happy's style at this point in time was the style that people will re- will know about now, where mm-hmm. it was this very like he was the star player and he kind of called around himself, and then the others were kind of like. Uh, I mean, kind of a bit of a freestyle, but like you, you have to kind of like, you don't have a whole lot of utility necessarily and you all go as a big group and sometimes and you just hit one bomb site at the same time. It's not really like a super tactical style, mm. right? Was it, was this actually a good style for Kenny S? <laughs> there is something like I said it before and I meant it. I truly, I truly respect Happy for what he did for his achievement for, you want everything. Yes. But among the players, the in-game leaders have played, yeah, that's, that's not, that was not the, the play style I wanted to play. And, uh, uh, that's not the play style I, I liked. And that's not the play style I, I had the most fun playing. Um, so yeah, I basically learned being really passive and being a support, uh, at some situations. Uh, so yeah, let's say that it was not the the best time that feels the best with with what I can do. Okay. So here's the thing, though. I always used to tell you, "What the fuck's going on? Just take over. Just tell them fuck those guys. Like, take the orb. Do whatever you want." Now, here's the thing. Okay, it's up to you if you want to reveal this. What What's the reason that you gave as to why you you didn't do that? Why you weren't like forceful and say like I should be the star player? Do you want to say the reason? What do you mean? Like why did Wasn't I? Did, it, didn't you tell me that you just basically you didn't because you yourself weren't super motivated and you weren't putting in all the hours? You felt like you couldn't say I should do everything around me, right? Mm. No, well, it's just it was working like that, and at some tournaments I till the end, like I still managed to to be good at some tournaments. Uh, I mean. That was not the best play style, but I mean, I was not totally useless. I didn't feel totally useless. Sure. I was still, I was, I, I was still a dangerous player for other people, and and yeah, I would not say that. Like, I mean, I have a huge ego. Uh, I have my ego, and but I would never like. I would. I've never come into team speak and say, "What the fuck is wrong? Why I'm not the star player?" Especially, it was working. Like, I mean, sure. the six first months in Envious were were working pretty well, and that yeah. was oh, Happy wanted things to go. Even though I'm not gonna lie, I didn't exactly listen to what he was asking me to do, because, for example, if I was doing everything he was asking me to do, I would not have had the hope on T side, for example. <laughs> And okay. Yeah, like he didn't want me to hop on T side most of the why, maps. Why though? What's the theory? Because he liked, uh, he really liked um, to have five rifles. He will like oh. to play a bit quick. He will like to play like stacked. Uh, but yeah, like the thing is, like one of my strengths is also playing like way close with the op, so I don't mind rushing with an op. Uh, so yeah, during some tournaments, I just didn't really listen to what he was asking me to do. Not like okay. everything, right? Yes. Uh, but I was doing my own thing sometimes and it was working and it was during tournaments. So he couldn't say much, even though after, like I always been really close to him and I know, oh, he can react sometimes. And I also didn't want to, you know, just to argue for for nothing and and just let things go and eventually coming to a point where you would need me more as uh, as a star player than a passive player, I would say. Okay. So uh, what people uh, might remember of this period after the French Shuffle is, like you say, it was working really well. Your team looked really good. You went to that first major, ESL1 Cologne. You made it to the final. You were playing Fnatic. Right? Yeah. At this particular time, 
It was the brand new Envious. So in theory, you know, it's not like the old Envious that always used to lose to Fnatic. You know, anything could happen here. But famously, not only did Fnatic win this final, but everyone remembers Kenny S on Cobblestone. Oh, damn. It was too emotional, right? It, everything went back. This is one of the worst games of your career, right? No, it definitely is. I mean, it's not like being emotional during the game. I was... No, I mean, I think what kind of... Like the way we lost the first map, it was super painful, right? Yes. First major final for me, for for Apex, for other players, first major final. Uh, actually, just for Apex and me, just for yes. major final. Yes. And the way we lost the, the first map was super painful. And yeah, I actually played decently on the first map. And the second map was, you know, during the time between maps, I tried to tell myself, okay, it's fine, just a map. It's a major final. You can't just, yeah. you know, you have to to go. And and the fact that I got beaten lucky during this game, I was bad. Um, I thought about the first map. So, yeah, I ended up with this score of 419, which I'll never forget. And, yeah, at the end, I would just, you know, everything was, I lost the major final. It's super painful. And I felt like everyone were laughing at me for for being so bad, and you know, so many people were watching. Yeah. And when you 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 just you just disappeared for the second map, and it's super hard. It's super super hard. Okay. So as you mentioned, though, for, and if people have been keeping track in the interview so far. Because you were always on the other side of all the shuffles, etc., it was usually the Shocks teams that did quite well at the majors, and your teams were the ones that either went on the group stage when you existence, or you had the one top <coughs> eight when you were with Recursive. So you'd never been as deep in a major before, right? If people have noticed, it doesn't matter who the player is. There are some really great players. I mean, people just saw it with FaZe, who, if you're in the final of a major... There is something different about a major, right? Like the final of a major is a different kind of pressure from a normal final, right? Uh, definitely, yeah. Like major final is, especially Korong, like Korong is, like Korong was the first time ever that I, I met stages before Korong, right? Sure. But the first the first time in Korong was so special for everyone. Like the goosebumps, like the world playoff was like the final was even more stressful and and uh with more pressure but the world playoff stuff was really like amazing to live and that gave like a lot of pressure too because it was the first time we can feel those goosebumps coming to a stage and yeah well, my a major final is always 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 special and i think no matter what people say about the majors um if you play a final, you will always feel the... Like, I played many finals, right? And the two finals I played major, they were, they had something special. For sure. sure. Yeah. So, okay, well, the, well, here's the thing, though. For you especially, this is actually, like, a great storyline. Like, if someone made a movie, this is exactly how it would have to go, you know? At first, you'd have to make the final, and then go really badly, because, you know, the, the, the hero can't succeed initially. But obviously, the very next major was the one where not only did you get to the final, not only did you win the tournament, but you basically were the star of the final, right? So, what changed? What changed? Well, I think uh, I learned from Korong some. Uh, I learned from Korong. Uh, I was more prepared, I think, in my head. Uh, or I, I went into the, uh, I went into the game. Uh, the way I put myself in a bubble. Uh, and the fact that I was facing Guardian, like the, you know, the the rivalry stuff we were talking before, yes. was the fact that I was facing him was really motivating too, because I remember like. He was like he played the semifinal against an IP, and Apex told me, "Look at it. He was really good doing it against an yes. IP." Yeah. And at the final, I totally destroyed him, right? So did Apex tell you that to kind of like try and hype you up? Like, oh, yeah, he's playing really great. Yeah, yeah, he did. Okay, he did, and 
but I was really ready. Like I was, I've never been ready before like that. Like the way I went into the game and everything was pretty, pretty much perfect. I felt the pressure. Like the pressure was really high. I felt the pressure, but like I didn't want to to live that live that again. You know, like the the shame. Not only about losing the major final, but the shame of performing that bad, and you know, I didn't want to lose that to to live that again. So I think that's that's the way I went into my bubble before the game, and and yeah. Okay, so after this period, like you won the major, you made all these these top twos at majors, and for a couple more months, there was still some good results, still some top placings for Envious. But then there was like literally almost a whole year that was just like, it was just depressing. Like maybe a good result for Envy Six Pack Mac, one or two top fours, you know. Yeah. And obviously at the majors, just going out in last place, like really shocking stuff. Because remember, in the earlier part of the interview, it's easy enough to go like, right, well, it's obviously just existence, he's cursed, you know. But now there's a Kenny S, Happy, MBK, these are legendary names and they're going out last place in majors. What do you think was wrong with the Envious team after that? Oh damn! What was wrong? Well, I, I think we never really find out <laughs> what was wrong. Um, like the problem, probably like showed up mostly before the major in Cluj, uh the major we won. Uh, I think there's a famous story that I think it was uh, Apex told, which is yeah. like that things were going so badly before the major that uh, we were, thought we were going to lose, right? We literally stopped practicing after one day of boot camp. We were about to disband. And we, were like, and we went to the tournament like, okay, guys, just, you know, play your best. And like, but knowing that the result would matter because... Like if we make like if we make an exit an early exit that would have been the most predictable predictable thing yeah. at this time uh, we will disband so yeah let's say that we are super close to disband uh, and we managed to win uh, so I think after that the problem we had uh, like the problem we had before Cluj that we didn't fix. Just got worse, you know. It's like it's like a, a human being. You stab him once, and you just don't patch up the um, the wound. Yeah, you just put a little bandage on, and you think yeah. that's fine. But obviously, it's going to get worse. Right? Yeah, and then you just get stabbed more, get stabbed more. At the end, there is so much bleeding that you you can't fix it. You know. Yes. That that's why the problem that with envious small problems. Big problems, everything that hasn't been fixed became so big that like we could not like bounce back and we could not like be a top team again. And okay. like we tried to change things, we made a lot of bad choices as well. Like I think um, the fact that we kicked Kyo was too early. Uh, the fact that we picked Devil was a bad pick. I'm just being honest, right? Sure, yeah. Um, like it was a lot of bad decisions too that led us to. And then let's say that the the happy game style got it a bit more predictable for the other teams. The other teams were better, and they knew how we were playing. And happy was not like. Um, Happy was just, you know. Yes. You know, okay, well, it doesn't, you, you know, it doesn't, it, it didn't want to change back then. It was like, it worked. It should yes. be working again. And no, the thing is, people adapt, you know. And the peop people adapt, and we could not uh, make sounds that we were right. Uh, it was really like into, like, if th things doesn't work, it's because you don't make it work, right? Yes. And like everything that happened with Envious is not entirely happy fault. Sure. Of course. But yeah, we also reached a point where 
We tried to make NBK in Game Leader. It didn't work out. We tried to make Happy back in Game Leader. We wanted Happy to be back, but at the end we stopped trusting him because we didn't, we could not, we could not like handle the way we are playing. And we wanted him to change. We wanted him to change his own game style as a player, not only as an in-game leader, but we wanted him to be more like a team player, right? So I think, I think we also got a lot of focus on Kyo, Devor, uh, Happy, and we had so much focus on them that we forgot that we are also a part of the problems. And yes. You know, as I say, like you don't patch up the wounds and it keeps bleeding and you die. <laughs> like I'm just dying. Sure. Okay. So at this time, like as we say, a lot of problems with the Envious squad, right? There was one result, which is obviously a very weird one because you went to the WESG finals and you won this tournament. And that was actually the most prize money ever in the history of CSGO at the time. It was, <laughs> yeah. it was actually insane. And obviously, you didn't even have to play Virtus Pro in the final because the fucking King yeah, team. That was super them. great. Was, super was it great. bizarre to win that much money when the team was basically almost dead anyway? And uh, it was not almost dead anyway. It was dead. Yes, <laughs> sure. It was dead. But like, if there is one time in our life that we can say that we played for money, it was for this tournament. And there's also that thing like we succeed with Envious, we had success. And yes. despite the fact that everything went wrong, uh, we decided to stop playing together. Things, we did things not certainly in the right way, especially for, for the players that we decided to, to kick, such as RP. You know, like I think we got a lot of him and he didn't. He's a human being, didn't deserve so much. Like, because at one point we were super mean to him and he didn't deserve that either. Even sure. if, like, and despite that, we wanted to, to finish the, the team in a good way. Like, we wanted it to be like, okay, things went bad lately, but like, that's this tournament and the major are going to be our last tournaments together. Just make sure it's gonna be good tournaments for us, and yeah, we we ended up winning and we got lucky to play Virtus Pro. But yeah, that was super great to be honest. This was a great, great summary. I mean, it was great. Okay, so as you mentioned there, it was already known before the actual official roster move happened. Well, I mean, here's the thing. Even if the exact lineup wasn't known, it was known it was going to happen, obviously, because if you look at it, Envious had all these problems. G2 was playing amazingly. Shocks and Scream looked amazing. Like, something, something's going to happen at some point in time. It's logical. When you made this team where finally you did team up with Shocks, what was the logic behind the team? Because if people remember, I remember the first LAN you played. It was the Star Series tournament, the one where you lost to FaZe, who obviously won the tournament. And in this tournament, actually, Shocks looked like the shocks I remember, like a star player, he was fucking super aggressive, really good rifle. But from then on, okay, G2 got good and they got much better and he won tournaments. But I mean, he even said himself, he was trying to be more of like, he's supporting the rest of the team and he's just the leader now. Why is shocks not being a star player in G2? Uh, well, I'm not in his head. Uh, but I would say it's like, I try to be like, to, I asked myself some question, and I think it's just hard as an in-game leader to like we want him to be the star, right? But I can feel sometimes you know you just don't want to to be selfish, and you don't you, you just feel like it's unfair that you can do things that people can do, and if I feel it too. But him as an in-game leader, I'm pretty sure it's much more stronger. Like, you know, like, he knows that we want him to be the star player, one of the star player, but uh, he has to make decisions as an in-game leader that will put him in comfortable area and comfortable positions, you know? And that's the selfishness that you have to 
to find what you're in game leader, that is super hard because like being selfish is super hard. I mean, you know, just just take whatever you want as an in-game leader and it's, yeah, I think you, you know what I mean. Sure. Like, you have so many responsibilities that it's getting, it's getting super hard. So one of the interesting things about the G2 era since you've been in the team is that even though the team itself has been so up and down and hasn't really kind of like lived up to what people hoped in terms of winning a major or winning like, you know, having having your own era, winning all the championships, etc. Your team, bizarrely, has been one of the best the entire 2017 at playing against SK Gaming. Yeah. And they had, obviously, the Phelps lineup. You won these two. In fact, both tournaments you won, you had to go through SK Gaming to win it. Now, so many other teams had so many problems playing against them. Whenever they play against like Astralis or FaZe, etc., they look unbeatable almost. You know, they just look like the perfect team. They always respond correctly to everything. What do you think has been the strength of G2 in these matchups? Why have you had so much success against SK? Well, I don't think there is a special secret or a special recipe about it. Um, <clears throat> I think it's mostly like two different game style fighting each other. I think in the story of CS, there is a lot of storyline like that that some teams are just struggling against the others, such as Fnatic against Titan back then. Yes. Um, or the or, or the matchup too. Um, I think the, our game style it really annoys them. Uh, I also think that players are like Cold Zero are kind of struggling playing against us. Um, I don't think there is something really special about it. I just think it's you know the game the game style just. Like I mean, our game style just fits their game their game style, and uh, that's that just all CS works. Uh, some game style just crushed all the game style, and and yeah, overall I think it's just uh, the fact that uh, our different game style are just. Do you yeah. think that you match up well against Fallen then? Hmm. I don't know. I would say that Fallen is actually really similar to me. You know, that is sometimes really like YOLO, I would say. Okay. <laughs> um, so, I don't know. I, I think, yeah, I kind of match up pretty well against him. Uh, overall, I feel confident in the uh, OP matchup anyway. OP matchups, but like, I don't feel like I have. Like there is some open that I can say that I, I'm, I feel really comfortable going to the matchup. Uh, Fallen is not one of them, definitely not. Uh, I feel like I don't feel like I have a special advantage on him. Uh, I feel like he's always being pretty good against us as well. Um, not unlike unlike Code Zero, for example. Uh, so no, I wouldn't say that. My teammates would say otherwise. I think they think that I have an advantage on him, but uh, I don't think Fallen is one of the... Like, it's pretty hard for me to play him because his game style is really similar to me. And it's not like he's predictable either. He's really unpredictable. And that's why I have like a lot of respect for him. Uh, despite the rivalry, I, uh, I truly... Like it's probably the only opera I truly respect, I would say, um, because yeah, he looks like me and he's really unpredictable and it's super tough to play against him. Okay, so uh, you know when I gave uh, when I was setting up the question there and I gave the context and I said even though you won these two big tournaments, mm -hmm. I mean people from the outside do look at G two and they say hasn't lived up to what they hoped it would be. Like it, it's kind of, it's been underwhelming a bit, you know, mm -hmm. like the, that, like there weren't as many playoff runs as we thought, and there weren't as many great finals and there weren't as many titles. I know what you came off that really bad year in Envious when it was even worse, you know, and it was like last place in the majors and you were never winning the big tournaments. 
do you kind of agree? Do you think 2017 was a bit underwhelming? Could should should this team have accomplished more with these players? Yeah, of course. Like even ourselves, we we had I am um, we had a super high expectation about ourselves, especially at, when we were creating the team. Um, we created the team as objective to be super good in the long term. So it's not like we are disappointed about 2017, but we obviously expected better. Um, especially that we created the team with supposedly the best players in the world and everything should be matching perfectly. Um, but yeah, definitely we people have our expectation. We also have our expectation about ourselves. And if you want me to to do a recap of 2017, I think the world would be the I had two worlds would be of course inconsistent and also a bit disappointing. Even though we we won two major tournaments, uh, it's still a bit disappointing. Okay. Because here's the thing. If people go back and they look at the stats, the stats were really good for Kenny S last year. Even in a lot of games you lost, you had really good stats. A lot of tournaments, you had some of the best in the entire tournament. Did you at least individually recover your, your form, do you think? No. No, I think I played... I think it was a good year. Um, from what I give, from what I give to the game, from what I give to my personal training, to what was my motivation, uh, I think it was a good year. But I think you know, and I know, and a lot of people know that I can do better. Uh, and the only problem is actually myself. And I mean, I have no problem saying that, that it's not like I've been repeating the same thing for for a month and I haven't really worked on that. But at least I'm aware that I'm capable of better. And, you know, sometimes uh, I'm just like, I'm just fine. And that's the problem I have is that I'm just fine with the level I have, you know. Yes. I'm just fine being like, I'm just fine being top seven in the world, but I should not because I know what I'm capable of and my teammates also know. And and yeah, despite the fact that my year has been pretty decent, correct, uh, I still feel like I can give more. I should give more. And yeah, some of my teammates think the same. Like, they've never been really like, well played, Kenny. Uh, they don't really compliment me about the, f- oh, I'm playing, the fact that I have some MVPs and stuff because they know that I don't give everything. You know what I mean? Sure. And yeah, well, what I can say is that I'm satisfied about my hero because I was not really giving my best. Yeah. Exactly. So I could not expect better. I could not be disappointed if I don't. Okay. If I don't give everything, I can. I cannot be disappointed. So, okay, then let me ask about that topic then, because here's one of the weird things. And I know in general, this is actually something that it just seems to be a French thing. Like I was talking about, I think in my interview with Apex, that like there's been some famous French football stars and tennis stars who had similar problems where, you know, they had a lot of talent. Mm -hmm. But then what happened was they were like, oh, cool. That means I can be really good at the game, but I can also like party and I can also like chill out, you know, I don't have to practice every day. And then the idea is like, you know, you know, some days I'll win, some days I won't. It's cool. Whereas, you know, there's a lot of sacrifice if you want to be like Cold Zero, for example, and never have a bad tournament, you know. So, okay, this is something that obviously at some time in his career shocks had the same problem you know he has the months where he was really motivated and he looked like fucking hell it's the best player ever and then he had the times when he wasn't motivated and he gets kicked out of teams and it, it, it's not as good and he isn't the superstar player to you have to here's the way here's why i want to ask you to explain this a little bit because you have to understand most people in fact most people who have played counter-strike 
never had amazing talent, you know. A lot of them were like okay players and they practiced and maybe they got a bit better and maybe they practiced some more and they got good, but they were never a pro player. To them, they can't understand what is it like to be so good that you can, let's say, play half as much as you should or play 60% and still have a chance in the game to win the match. So to them, they always think to themselves, if I had those skills, I'd go 100%. Now, listen, maybe they're being naive. I mean, most people in life don't go to 100%, but it's hard. you can see what I mean. It's hard for outsiders to understand, right? Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I think you can uh, say all... Um so you want me to explain why? Like, I mean, I don't really understand what asking me to... Like, well, okay, question. how about this? Explain this to me, okay. So if the part people can't know is what your life's like. So mm. if you get up in the morning and, you know, let's say you have practices at, I don't know, 8 p.m. or something or 7 p.m. or something. And so you've got a few hours before then, right? To someone who's a naive fan and doesn't know anything about the way the game works, they might think to themselves, oh, if I was being paid we won't say the amount, but a lot of money every month. And if I had a chance to maybe win the next big tournament or win the next major, okay, well, I definitely, I'd get all my DM in and I'd do my extra, you know, my FPL and I'd, and then I'd play the scrims and I'd, I'd try and be the best player who ever lived. But clearly, so okay, maybe sometimes that happens, but a lot of days that doesn't happen, right? So is, is Counter-Strike the game? Is it not as fun? Is it not as exciting as it used to be to you to play? Well, I'm going to be super honest right now. Like... People might change their opinion about me and I will totally understand. But I want to be really honest, uh, saying, yeah, um, I still love being CS. Um, what I love about CS is the competition now. Uh, the practice side, uh, that is definitely the most important thing in the, like, in the world, sports world. I mean, yes. like not only CS, but physical sport as well. Everything practice is, is the key. Uh, like, yeah, it kind of gets not boring, but like the practice part is more like, you know, the job part. It's like yes. the professional part. And it it's not like I, I'm not really practicing by passion anymore. And... That's something I have to to find again, like the passion, you know. Like I I will always love going to a stage, playing a a, a major game, uh, a game during playoff. That's why I always been better during playoff, because like more pressure I have, uh, more context I have, like more when I, I want to play, and that's the envy I want. I I, I kind of lost when I'm practicing is like, you know, we started traveling much more than we did like a few years ago. And we practice also more than we used to do. Uh, but of course, like we are, we are paid for this and we should not complain and we should just practice. We are sport killed. I'm a fucking sport kid. <laughs> um, sure. In your own way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I quit school when I was 16. Um, I joined the best team in the world when I was 15. I'm a super lucky person, right? Uh, have you ever I've, thought about retiring? Has it ever crossed your mind? Has it ever, have yeah, you ever come close? Yeah, yeah. I mean, even this year, it happened. It happened before a tournament that we won. Like, it happened because... It happened. I don't know why it happened, but it happened because, as I said, it's, I'm talking about myself. I don't know about other people that might have the same problem, but I'm a really emotional person. And every every time I have something happening in my life, um, I just feel like I, I just feel like playing CS sometimes. Setting uh, putting CS as my first priority, it just make me miss a lot of. Other part, you know, the the part that I'm spending time with my friends, we're spending time with my family, my girlfriend, sure. everything. And I think I know that I have to make sacrifice, uh, sacrifices, but I didn't really realize that. And I just hope I will realize that before I get that huge slap I was talking about. Yes. You know? <laughs> we don't want another one of those. That... Like, because if it happens, I could, like, like today I could just be gone and 
not being able to but not being able to to come back and but yeah, I'm just being honest and the fact that I'm emotional just you know the feeling I have on the moment it influences a lot on what I'm gonna do. It's like. Yeah, it's like uh, I'm really having fun with my friends lately. I just prefer spending time with my friends than playing CS. And, you know, that's the the thing that I, that's my problem, I would say. Okay. Right, here's the thing. I know that nearly every player in G2, just like the Envious lineup, they do kind of like that happy game style where you do the four spies and you do like half buys and you play, you, you try to just break the opponent's economy and you, you make a lot of crazy individual plays because the other members of the team, that is kind of how they play. That's, that's, that's what they like to do. They're all rifle players. But surely someone who is a primary AWPer, you can't be a big fan of that style, right? I mean, it means you're going to get lost AWPs, surely. No, no, no. I'm not. I'm not a fan of that. Especially that. Um, no, I, I'm not a rich. Well, today's different because I I learned to manage my money. And for example, if Shock's scoring like force buy, I can just buy like my utilities and the deagle, like just to make sure that I can be. I can have an op, right? Okay. It's like when he says force buy, I don't have to force buy myself. Right. You know. But back then, yeah, back then it was super annoying. Uh, it was super annoying because, yeah, as you just said, um, I mean, I'm definitely feel comfortable playing with a rifle, but my strength as a player is to play with an op. And I don't get, I didn't really get the point of, of using me, but not as a no player. Like it doesn't make sense, right? Yes. So, yeah, let's say that when it first started being like that, and I didn't really know how to manage my money, uh, what to really do. Um, if I had to play the round 100%, make sure I have the the full the full utilities, full care of AK, or if I just had to to buy hand off to to help in the round. Uh, that was so confusing back then that yeah, I didn't like it because I was not doing it in the right way. But yeah, today I just. Like it doesn't really change the fact that I will have up during the the world T side or C D side because I have to manage my money better and if I don't get an op it's just my bad. Okay. Because but there is another factor to this, right? Which is also kind of the same story as when you're an envious, which is you can't really go and tell all these players like Give me the all do things the way I way. If if they also know that you don't play hundred percent and you you're not the most dedicated player, right? It's, you'd kind of be an asshole to do that. So you can't really do it, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, you're right, but I think they, despite the fact that they know that I'm not like, first of all, I'm sometimes dedicated, right? Uh, it just you have like, little stretches, yes. Exactly. Uh, I mean, I'm not an asshole all the time, <laughs> but no matter what. Even if they know I'm not the hard worker of the team or, or what, they they know what I can bring to the team. Even though I, well, I'm not like at my at my best, they know what I can bring to the team. And like for example, Apex, I've been playing with him for three years. He's seen he kind of seen me being like at my best level, being maybe the best player in the world. He's seen me being in the slump. Even though I've pretty been pretty consistent, I would say uh, I've never been in a really tough slump, but I've never been like at my top level at 100 percent. But I mean, if seen me in many ways and many many shape, and no matter what, like if I tell him to jump for me so I can pick afterwards, he will do it. And like every teammates I had, I mean. Almost every chance I had would have done the same. So the fact that I have a shaky, inconsistent way to practice, like they obviously care about it, but it's not like it's gonna it's gonna change anything in game or it's not gonna change the way they use me. If you okay. if it makes sense, yeah. Yes. Okay, so I wanted to know about NBK, right? Because here's the thing. 
of the French players. He's what obviously he's the one of the ones who had the best English and always talked to other people. So it's one of the ones that a lot of us know better. And from my time knowing him, here's the weird thing. I know a lot of these lineups, like the Envious lineup and the G2 lineup at times last year, outsiders don't understand what's going on. They're like, why is it so inconsistent? And why are these problems? And why are they doing different things? But I know that NBK is someone who is quite a serious guy. Like he's always thinking of like, what's the solution to this? What can we do differently? What can we... Is, is he a different person than the other French players? What do you mean? Is he a what? Is he kind of a unique guy? Well, for sure, he's a very special person. <laughs> Uh, is a very smart person. Is also he also can be really strict somehow. Um, I think he always yeah he doesn't he didn't make like every choice he made was not the right ones. Most of them were the worst ones to be honest. Sure. I mean, NBK is really way well known for being. Uh, the investigator of most of the shuffles, for example. Yes. And yeah, I mean, like everyone kind of respect him a lot in France. Uh, some people don't really like him because sometimes he used to be an asshole or <laughs> sure. uh, like uh, I remember sometimes him being super ruthless ruthless yes yeah absolutely. ruthless yeah. um so yeah the fact that he's ruthless you know like he he doesn't do that to hurt you but he does that to improve the team he does that to improve yourself and he does that for himself too of course but like as i said about existence the existence is the same is super ruthless ruthless so Sometimes you just get issue with the person because of that. But yeah, he's, he's without any doubt the best player I ever played with, NBK. In what sense? I think everything, like his way of thinking, um, the world he has in the game, what he can do, what he, kind of everything, him as a player, him as Sometimes it just takes like too much space in a gym in a way that he wants everything. He's a perfectionist, right? So sometimes it might take too much space, especially back then in Envious because, and he was right about it because he was doing the job of other people. He was doing the manager job. He was doing quite everything. And... Yeah, that's why I have like a huge respect for him because he's he's super complete as a person, as a player, and and I think despite the fact that he can have that that picture of himself by other players, the fact that he created like most of the French teams, he, he still got. I, I'm still playing with him for years now, and I've seen I've seen him evolve, like. Is much more sociable than it used to be. He, it's much easier to talk to him than it used to be too. And I forgot the question, of course. It's all right. <laughs> you gave a good answer there. Okay. <laughs> so at this most recent major, everything was looking great. Your team 3 0 next stage 3 0 Admittedly, you didn't play the hardest teams, but you know, it's still doing pretty well. And one of the teams that you obviously beat was Cloud9. And then yeah. you got to the quarterfinals and everyone thought, cool, this is exactly the team you want to play. They have a similar style, you know, but it was working out well before. What happened in this match? Because it's not like, it, like here's the thing, no matter who anyone thought was going to win the match, everyone thought this will be an amazing game. Maybe it might be three maps, might be really backwards and forwards. And instead they won kind of easily, right? So what, what happened in this match? Well, there's a lot of things to say about it. Well, first of all, Cloud9 was probably one of the matchups I didn't want to draw. Uh, the, just the fact that we beat them in group stage, like playing them again was just weird, you know. I didn't really want to play them again. But yeah, I mean, it's not FaZe, it's not SK. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so why did we lose this game? Like, uh, I think we 
we got super happy about reaching the legend statue. Uh, and we played super great. And the thing is that kind of changed our man- mentality, I would say. Um, like, to be honest, if you want my opinion, I think at one point during the major, uh, between the first and the third week, like, I would have told you we are the best team in the tournament. I thought you were going to win, yeah? And I don't know if I thought we were going to win, but I knew we had the best team, right? And the mentality kind of changed after the group stage because, first of all, our objective was to reach the group, the playoff. Yes. Like we practiced for that and we practiced a lot on four maps, right? So we were ready on four maps. We practiced for the best of one and everything went perfectly. Coming into the playoff and the best of three against, um, against Clan 9, we played Mirage, which was a map that we didn't play for, for weeks. We didn't prepare it and we are kind of like it's pretty sad to say, but that was our break team no matter what, and you know, but we are not ready to play it, and we are ready to start the best of three with just a one, like zero one. Yes. And then I think we we might have failed a veto. I mean, we felt confident on overpass. But I think we also underestimate ourselves on other maps such as Cobblestone. Um, I mean, maybe the two you could have really gone with was Cobblestone or Cash, right? Yeah, but the fact that we didn't play Cash is because we played them in, uh, during the group stage and we beat them pretty. And it's like Fnatic was doing this before. Yes. Like uh, if they beat a team during the tournament on the map, they would veto it afterwards. And we just did the same because we didn't want them to to add up to a game style, and especially okay. that the f- how we beat them in group stage was a lot about counter them, like counter the game style, and how they were playing. Um, so yeah, I think the, we're not we're super ready to go into a best of three because because of the way we practiced. Also, I think we didn't practice enough. Uh, we practiced before the tournament a lot, and we we're ready. But during the during the tournament and during our day off, we didn't practice much. I think at the end of the tournament, we all had like 30 hours past week, which is definitely not enough. Um, well, I got the flu. I got the flu before the game, like uh, going to Boston. Going to Boston, I had the flu, and I was in bed for for three days, and I went to the game with. You know, a bit tired because the treatment in the U.S. is different from Europe, and it makes you super tired. But that's not an excuse in itself. Uh, I mean, we could have played more no matter what. Uh, so yeah, everything was was super bad. Our T side on overpass is was pretty shaky. Uh, was pretty shaky. That's why I think the veto. Like, I mean, we all agreed to play overpass, so we don't have any regrets about it. But if you have to think about, about it again, we just think that we just thought that it was maybe not the best idea, considering that we have better maps. And despite the fact that our CD side on overpass is super strong, our T side has been super shaky. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I think um, all of those reasons were. Where why we lost against Clan Nine, um, yeah, I mean, okay. uh, Apex have to lead on Mirage, and we haven't played Mirage for a while, so his calls were pretty shaky as well. Like I mean, a lot of reasons why. I mean, most of the reasons are just on ourselves, and the the other reasons are just the fact that that's the way we practiced and. Like I know it doesn't sound like G2, like the team we are and the expectation we have about ourselves, the expectation people have about ourselves, but people have to understand that like we have so many early exits in group stage uh, for the majors that it was super important for us to to reach that stat, the, that legend statue again. So okay, uh, uh, up until 2016 began, 
uh, people who only started following the game recently might not realize how crazy this is. But basically, at the majors, France was literally the next best country after Sweden. Now, obviously, Sweden was in like every major final, you know, and they were winning loads of them. Okay, cool. Yeah, they have Fnatic, they had an IP. But after Sweden, it was definitely France. France had won majors, was in all these top fours, finals. Ever since then, as you kind of described here, it was always group stage exits for both French teams. And then except for this most recent major where you made top eight and that was it. Has something, is there something about the French scene that's kind of like not as good now or something's broken about the scene? Why, why is, why aren't we seeing majors for France again? I mean, it has to happen again at some point in time. Mm. Let me think. It depends on the major because like, for example, the, the PJ Krakow major was, for example... Like it was during our slam, for example. So it was a super bad timing. Uh, so I would not say it's unlucky because it's not unlucky, but it's just like we're in a slam and it's a super bad timing. Uh, the major before was like we knew we would disband, both teams knew yes. that we would disband. So yeah, I think I, I, I could not explain what I'm. I think overall CSGO has always been a super tough and competitive game. Uh, the level is super high. Um, the level is super high and you can't expect to win all the time. And no matter what people might think, and the French team has always been showing kind of inconsistency. Um, so yeah, definitely we had like, we started having issue with majors uh, and that's why it was so important for us to, to go through this time because yeah, two years and a half without going through is a lot and it's a lot for the French team because the French team has been super talented but yeah, I mean, those last two years were pretty bad for, for, for all of us. Um, like some wins time to time, uh, G2 winning the ECS, um, Envy winning the game show. And, but overall, I think the friendships were, were having slumps those last two years and, and were not performing at all. So uh, the early exits in group stage were pretty expected anyway. Okay. So, okay, as people can tell by the storylines that we've discussed in this interview, every time teams like have the issues or people, I mean, like MBK, etc., decide, okay, this, this isn't working, you have these famous French shuffles. And this was actually the first time that it didn't really happen when it could have happened. Like Envious obviously is not in great shape. They had their problems even with some of their players. Now you've had the situation where, okay, G2 was good, but then didn't really deliver on it and had some good results, but some inconsistent results. Right? Even if all the G2 players totally say, no, we're going to stick with it and we're going to keep trying. Is there a part of you sometimes wonders, is a French shuffle going to happen or does some of these players want to do that? Well, I don't think it happened. Well, not in our team. Uh Let's say that the way we lost the major was with trading because we didn't show up at all uh, during the quarterfinal. Uh, so we are obviously super disappointing and pretty angry at ourselves. But as I said, we had an objective coming to the major. And the fact that we reached that objective and that we played good overall, I think it didn't like, it didn't show, it didn't show up in in people's heads that we had to, to make a change or, or anything. I think the, the way we played the major was, I think we did what we wanted to do. We did the minimum. Yes. Uh, but what we tried to keep in mind after the major was the work we did and the progress we did and tried to to not focus too much on the on the quarterfinal. 
Because if you focus on the quarterfinal, I think, uh, yeah, <laughs> we could have changed players. We could have changed anything <laughs> sure, because yes. a- everything was terrible. Yeah. That was one of the worst games to play. But yeah, okay. I think yeah, yeah, just the fact that we reached our objectives and we finally got that that legend statue. Just the f- just that made made sure that no shuffle was happening. Okay, right. This will sound like a weird question, but I think it's a good one to ask. So in G two, when this team is so up and down, it's actually not like I can tell you. People who are analysts have no clue how to predict it. Like I think almost every time I've given up on the team is when you come and you like win Dream Mac Malmo, or then there was the epicenter one where in the groups mm. like. Of all the teams in that group, I think you had a pretty hard group. I never expected G2 to win this group because I didn't think you were going to 2-0 everyone. Yeah. Can you actually yourself kind of tell when you go into a game if the team is going to play really well or if it's going to be the, one of those games where it just all goes to shit? Can you, do you have a sense for this or does it surprise you? No. Um, well, for example, the fact that we won Malmö was the most unexpected thing ever. <laughs> I mean, before the tournament... It was so f- well in- unexpected, but like, yeah, um, during the tournament, all we are playing, all things were going. I knew that, like, it's like the major, right? I, I know we had every chances to win the major. Uh, like, the result we make sometimes are really unexpected, even for ourselves, uh, even for us that. Sometimes we expect to win and everything is going super bad and sometimes we don't expect anything and going, going and everything is going super super good. Um, but yeah, I think uh, seeing all the, the team is going, the team chemistry, uh, the mentality, I can predict before game if you're gonna win or not. Like I mean with this lineup, uh, I've already been going to a game thinking it's not gonna work we're gonna get crushed and we get crushed you know I mean yeah like it's that's something I can I can feel if we're gonna be not like I can feel in a really short term like just before the game all things are going you know okay I can't predict the result of the next tournament we're gonna attend but before the game or I will probably need like the first game to to happen to know what's gonna be next. But yeah, I think like every tournament for us, everything is different all the time. So when uh, the G two team before you joined it, when it was last year and they had RPK and they had Scream, right? People remember that yes, okay, Shox was the in game leader of this team, but in terms of like in game leader, he wasn't like you know super tactical and like studying every demo, etc. I mean, a lot of how they won those games was like the star players ran in and shot everyone with AKs. Like it, it was kind of quite basic CS in some sense. Now this year, when Shox has been the, well, technically last year, 2017, when he's been the in-game leader of the G2 that you've been in, clearly he has tried to do different things with the style that the team's played with. And he's tried to change the map pool, for example, and, and, and try and have more tactics and have a different approach. Right. I, I saw an interview fairly recently that he did where someone asked him actually about existence. And he said actually quite complimentary things. He said that he will always respect existence because he's a guy where he now knows as an in game leader, like how much work he was doing, basically, like, you know, how many hours he was putting in and all the study he did and how difficult it is to get all the tactics down, etc. So it sounds like Shox himself still knows that he's not really like uh, that type of in game leader, even if he's tried it a bit. Has it been a confusing process for him, do you think, to be an in-game leader and to change his role like this? Mm. Well, uh, I think he knows better than me. <laughs> but, yeah, I think he tried to, like, to add up to the players he had. Uh, I mean... Like, does I he think, try and watch all the demos and come up with like no, all, all these innovative no, stuff? No, no, it doesn't. It doesn't. I mean, yeah, I mean, he's looking for, like, he does some tactics and stuff, but it doesn't look demos, uh, especially because we have a coach and analyst and, like, he works a lot with the coach, but tactical stuff and stuff. Okay. But 
I think the the second lineup G2 was really confusing for him because he didn't really know the players he was playing with. Um, he was not expecting players such as like Apex and BK or myself to be all we are. Um, it changed a lot. We changed a lot of game style uh, during the last season. Um, so yeah, I think he, he might have over. I've been overthinking for a while. Uh, and yeah, as I said, we changed a lot of game style. And that was confusing for everyone, and that was confusing for him. And I think it didn't help us to be consistent. Um, but yeah, I think he just got surprised by the way things went uh, with this G2 lineup. Uh, he was surprised to, to see that players were not like... Or he was expecting them to be, um, and he also reached a point where it's, you know, sometimes he should have given more responsibility to the other players. He should have trusted more the players, like he can, like he does today, for example. I mean, today we, like, he has much more less responsibilities than we used to have during the the beginning of the team. Okay. So that's why he has been pretty pretty good lately. I mean, he's performing better because we also change games again. But I mean, he has given more responsibilities to to the other players, and so he can focus more on himself. And I think that was uh, the the hardest things for him because for the first lineup with G two, he was more like a star player despite yes. being the in-game leader because he knew the player he was playing with for a long while and definitely trust them more and give them more responsibilities than he might have done with us, I think. Okay. Right. At the end of this interview, Kenny, do you have a message for people or do you want to thank someone or do you want to say hello to someone? Uh... Well, it doesn't, it's not like a, a regular interview where I would say thanks to the fans, but of course, the fans always being here for me. Uh, I mean, actually, no, on that, let, let me ask you something quickly about that. Okay, even though you said, you know, you've had your issues with motivation, etc. one yeah. thing I actually have noticed about your career is, even though it wasn't until the last sort of like year, year and a half that you started to do more interviews and you started to be more vocal in English, you know, obviously a lot of the French players traditionally didn't speak English as much. You've always been very, very popular with fans, right? Every time I ever see you go out on stage, even fans who are like the the cr fans of the other team, they always get kind of hyped about you, right? Yeah. Do you think you've all? Why do you think that is? Have you got some sort of special connection with them? Why, why do Why do people like you so much? Um, I thought about it. I think it's mostly because of the kind of player I am. Uh, also because of my Titan Hera. Because of my game style, that can be really impressive. Because I'm an opera, uh, people love opera, and also because, I mean, I'm not the most humble person in the world, definitely not. But, <laughs> yes. but people can see like, like, I think people think that I'm humble because that's what I I want people to to see about me because. Like myself, I want to be a bit less arrogant and putting my e my ego and my pride a bit less on the side, and that's why I want people to to think about me. That I want them to to know that I respect other people, right? I respect other people. I respect other players, and despite the fact that I'm definitely not the most humble, I just I do respect everyone, and. Yeah, also because despite the fact that my motivation and my my dedication on the game has been shaky, I always gave a lot of interest to to my fans because like I know it doesn't sound original, but that's the entire truth. Like I would not be here without them. And I would not have the what I have today without them. I would not have a salary like that without them. I yes. would not be living a dr the dream job without them. You know, like so many stuff happening because they're here. Uh, so yeah, I'm just trying to make them feel that. 
and and you know I'm I think I'm always being nice doing tournaments with them so yeah, I think there is no reason for them to hate me and that's mainly that's why uh, I'm I'm popular okay. I guess okay I interrupted you so who else do you want to thank or say hello to uh, and then I want to thank you uh, not only because of the the reflection stuff but because um, I mean you're a really respected person in the uh, in the scene uh, for like you might be an asshole too sometimes because certainly yeah, yeah <laughs> but I mean you like CS needs you definitely more than you need CS um, and like everyone like nobody is indifferent about you like either they like you or they just hate you sure, so yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah I just want to thank you because you always believe in me and I mean you never been always nice but most of the time you were I mean you were like oh, I deserve you to be towards me kinda uh, I mean lately I haven't seen you being super nice to me but I mean I understand why and I fully agree with you uh, I mean, here's but, the thing. Okay, Kenny. Actually, I'll just I'll just answer some on that. Okay, one of the reasons why I can see why that can be confusing to pro players sometimes because I have certain pro, other pro players who like I'm friendly with, you know, and some of them think that sometimes I just like don't like them as a person anymore. But what they don't understand is it's never about what I like as like them as a person like if I'm, if I'm friends with them yeah I like them as a person but what I want everyone to do it's what I want myself to do as well and I don't always succeed myself is I want everyone to be the best version of themselves yeah and sometimes that means that unfortunately if you're friends with someone you know you kind of have to be able to go ah, it's okay that everything didn't go well we're mates you know it's no problem but and that's my struggle is sometimes I feel like you have to sometimes be a bit harsh with some people not too much you're right you're an asshole if you go too far I probably do sometimes but I kind of I want to drive people to be the best they can be. Yeah, well, I understand that. I fully understand that, and and that's sad that some people doesn't doesn't understand that. And I mean, that's stupid to not think that way. But I mean, it is what it is. But yeah, what I want to say is that you believe in me in some times, so like where I felt super like sad and depressed about my career, about myself, um, about like, I can remember the, you messaged me after the, the final against Fnatic. And I can also remember that you were one of the first person I hugged when I won the major. So yeah, just, um, thank you for, for that. And thank you for, for what you do for CS in eSport overall. And that's pretty much it. Okay. Merci beaucoup. You're welcome. <laughs> this video was supported by Dean Tanglis, Michael Allaire, Andreas Westerland, Alex Adams, G-Man, Twitch Twitch Twitch, Jerky's Minion, Anthony, Tigreb, Jake Petrucci, Jordan Senkov, Daniel Yordanov. Want to get exclusive teasers for my upcoming work? Submit questions for me or make suggestions for my content? Become a part of the ever-growing Skrilluminati via Patreon link in the description box below.